Oh, that was close. We made it on time and we're getting some feedback. Where's the plan at? Hey everybody, how you doing? First off, let me just get myself together here. I can hear myself in my headphones. I don't know why. That means I must be watching my own stream. Oh yeah, I was changing the title. What's up everyone? How you doing on time gang? First, what's up rollers? Congratulations on being first today. Hello all. What's up, M. Jean, Devo8, how you doing? What's up, Greatest Rob, how you doing? YGBSM, Andrew Lane, good to see you. Like I haven't seen your name pop up in a while. It's good to good to have you, good good, good to see your name, you know? Welcome, welcome to the stream. I just, uh, let me, first of all, let me cut on some music. I was almost late. I was uh, downstairs trying to brew a little, uh, you know, a little bit of coffee, and uh, luckily my wife just helped me out and also brought the water. So, you know, we, we're, we're pretty prepared today. We just get some music. I was like, everything feels off right now. It's quiet. It is quiet. You know, just click a button. And uh Yeah, there we go. How are things going? Things are going okay, you know. Uh things are going all right. I can't I honestly I can't complain. Uh a little tired, you know, uh busy, very busy, but that's a good thing. Um, you know, I was able to make myself a nice little cup of coffee. Love you. Um yeah, uh, things are going, things are going fine. Uh, just, you know, just trying to deal with, with COVID. You know, 2020 has been uh, weird on everybody. So as good as any of us can be in 2020. Oh man, Jitter Ted, two days, is that two days in a row? Welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for the early raid. We are just getting started. I'm just getting set up as usual, uh, getting my computer set up. I did not fix everything that I was supposed to fix. Um, if anyone was watching yesterday, I switched up, I switched back to my System76 laptop. I'm not gonna be using the, um, I am not going to be using the VM. Right now I'm going back to the System76 laptop, but I did that right before the stream yesterday. And uh, so my inputs are a little bit weird. You know, my, my, I don't, everything's not as fluid as it, sh as it should be because, uh, you know, I made that abrupt change, but everything is going good. What's up, Jitter Ted? What's up everyone from Jitter Ted's party? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the channel. I hope everyone's good. Yeah, stay, stay. Today we're gonna be talking about, uh, I'm, you know, again, I've done this every time. I even did this last time during the uh, intro to uh, to DevOps stuff. Maybe I shouldn't do this, but uh, you know, we're, we're on the this piece, at least tonight about the on-prem stuff. It's not the most exciting stuff. We're not gonna be able to do that much hands-on stuff tonight. Besides, uh, we will be spinning up an RDS instance and kind of messing around with that. But a lot of the stuff tonight is, uh, is, is gonna be really good information to know. Um, uh, you know, to kind of round out some of your knowledge of the cloud, uh, the on-prem stuff. There's a lot of organizations who are who utilize things like this, but it's not as useful for you if you just want to mess around with the cloud or want to play around. It's not quite as useful uh, for that. You can't just kind of go play with some of this stuff uh, that we're going to be talking about tonight, which which is why I think it's a little bit boring in comparison to the, uh, some of the other stuff. Uh, you, last night, I got everyone out a little bit early. Tonight, you know, I, I didn't say it until halfway through last night and it's still we still got everyone out a little bit early like 15 20 minutes early tonight i'm gonna go for the same to get you out of here um at least 20 minutes early um mostly informational stuff we'll try to set up maybe like a wordpress thing or something tonight but uh yeah we will uh we'll knock that stuff out so let me just get set up what time is it 704 i'm just waiting for my coffee to uh, i poured it right at seven you know i went in from before i before i plunged the french press you know, uh, what am I, what am I drinking tonight? Tonight I'm drinking, uh, ceremony coffee, um, antithesis, the antithesis of ceremony coffee. I don't know what that means. You know, I, I only got this French press because I got free coffee from, I used to get free coffee in the office. I drink coffee almost purely for, out of necessity. Uh, like I'm not, I don't drink, you know, five cups a day. I don't even drink coffee every single day. I drink it when I feel like I need it. Um, I, you know, I'm going to be up tonight doing some stuff. I want a little bit of energy boost. So I decided to grab some. And once we were on lockdown, I didn't really want to buy a whole coffee maker because I thought that was a lot filters, all that stuff for someone who makes uh, coffee relatively occasionally a couple times a week. So I saw a French press at target. I got it because you know, we, uh, or on the fancy train. We want to be fancy, you know, it's all about perception and uh, you know saving uh, I guess I'm saving Coffee filters, but then I had to buy a, a coffee grinder because I uh, like Coffee ground coffee is like too fine to go in here and like uh, I don't know man. I was struggling. So I'm gonna plunge. I'm gonna plunge right now just to 
usually it's pretty satisfying, but I'm not making much coffee right now. And then I'm gonna put it in my sweet adulting cup right here that uh, I did receive for my 30th birthday. This is my mom's, uh, you know, she said, this is what you get for being an adult. So I'll pour it, so we'll have it. And everyone knows if you drink a cup of coffee while doing anything computer related, uh, it just makes it better. It's just, you know, it's just, just what you do. Ah, smells like uh, coffee. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I try, I'm trying to get the refined coffee palette. Didn't really work. Uh, didn't really work for me. Uh, you know, it's fine, completely fine. But uh, I'm not tasting all the floral notes that I'm supposed to be tasting in the uh, bits of cocoa. And uh, you know, I'm not getting all that stuff because my my palate is pretty juvenile. And you know, I love chicken tenders. I love uh, you know chicken tenders and some coke and some French fries. Is you know, it, my wife hates to hear that, but it's something that I love. Uh, so I can't really, uh, I'm struggling with that. I, I, I do have the taste. I have acquired the taste for beer and I'm getting it for like whiskey. I'm, I cur I'm currently going through a bottle of scotch. Uh, so I'm trying to pick that back up. I'm trying to, you know, understand that world a little bit more as well. But I heard I heard good things about uh, AeroPress Jitter Ted. I'll, I'll try one of those. I've heard good things about them. Would you recommend uh, using in Python to create dialogue decision tree? That's a good question. Um, what would you use? And so I'm assuming this is going to be going on a website. I mean, there's a number of different ways to kind of implement that. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a number of different ways um, to do it. Um, I, let's uh, hmm, actually, I think there might be a, I think there might be a point at tonight when that's good to talk about that exact thing. But try to bring that up um, kind of midstream because I think there's gonna be some technologies that we may discuss uh, that may help you out with something like that. Always first world problems, always. Oh yeah, Alt F4, I, I love Alt F4 stream. Hello, good to see you Alt F4. Let me give you a shout out. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling over here. Like I said, my setup is a little different than what I would like it to be because I changed it last minute. Let me uh chat, yeah, there we go. I do love that I'm back on my system 76 laptop. Again, it's just, the experience is just so much better than the VM, even though the VM had just the VM had more power than my laptop does, but uh, it was just it didn't run very well. What is it? It's the. Alt. And so now I had gotten decent at typing on my well, not very decent, but uh, you know, OK, at typing on my custom beautiful keyboard, which is still sitting right beside me, but using the laptop keyboard is really throwing me off. So it's a little tough, but okay. Let's, um, now that I'm set up, <laughs> I did a lot to set up. Um, actually, no, I didn't. Did I, I'm behind. I'm sorry, everybody. One second to let me, did I even, did the stuff even launch in the Google classroom? If not, let me, um, I don't think it did. Let me get you the slides. I did not. Okay, one second. Topic one zero. I know you can't see the screen. Uh, what is today? Today is on prem. Uh, RDS, on prem hybrid, hybrid cloud, and hybrid and RDS. And let me get all this stuff in cha for y'all. We'll get it in cha. Give you some material, give you some slides. Add slides. See, this is why you do some things beforehand. You know, I, I did. Uh, I, I at least did the did the course beforehand. Uh, if I did not do the other things that I was supposed to do, I'm sorry. Uh, let me get you Google Drive is what I want to look in. Yeah, that's what I want to look in and attach on prem. Add it. Put it under the right topic. And post it. There you go. And we'll go to Academy View. Um, and then I'll just click on it and I will give it to you as well. Let's get the, uh, no, don't present. We want to share this, share this with the world. Let's get a public link ready for anyone with the link and let's copy. Let's head back over to here and paste it. Okay. Now. Tonight is the world of on-prem and RDS. Uh, more computer stuff. 
I, th I do think some of the stuff that we're going to be learning tonight is cool. Um, but most of the most of the stuff tonight isn't um, it is on the cloud. These things are on the cloud practitioner practitioner exam, uh, but they're more of, hey, do you know what this thing is? Um, and maybe and maybe maybe what it does um, uh, rather than like really how to implement anything with it. Uh, so it's, it's more to just be familiar with these things. But uh, I really as we go deeper into the cloud, um, it's important to go over these things because there's going to be times when you are working at companies, whether or not you're a software engineer or security or whatever, we're going to have to solve problems and knowing about these uh, these different tools to uh, that you can use to get your job done uh, is going to be super helpful. The mid morning boost. Uh, so I, so does the AeroPress work? Uh, so I read an article about how uh, I, I don't drink a lot of I don't drink that much coffee, but about how I guess they did a study and because you're not filtering out anything in the French press coffee, I guess it has more carcinogens, which is bad for cancer, things like that. Uh, so I was looking at more filter coffee, but I didn't want to buy filters. because I don't do that much. I, I saw some cool pour over coffee stuff, um, but those have filters as well, but that's fine. You know, I'll buy those. Um, or the AeroPress, it, if anyone has any uh, insight between the two of those, uh, if you prefer either one, let me know. Let me know which one you prefer, because I'm, I'm I'm taking a look at those. Will you only cover services, uh, only service that will be replacements for on-prem habits? No, um, well, RDS is not one of them, but uh, yeah, we're gonna cover, we are gonna cover those services, which uh, can be deployed on-prem. Um, so they have a number of services that can be deployed on premises uh, or kind of in tandem with other things. So we're just going to cover those real quick. Uh, and then we're going to do a little bit of we're going to we're going to play with RDS a little bit. So we're going to get hands on with RDS. But the other stuff we we're just going to talk about because we don't really have a premises. We don't really have an on prem. We don't have anything that we could kind of use this stuff for RDS pulls out the bottle of tequila. That's fair. Uh, RDS is RDS is one of those very interesting services that I have a love hate relationship with. Uh, and I think that's mostly because I just have a love hate relationship with relational databases. We will be talking uh, a little bit about broadly about databases before we dive into RDS. So don't sweat that at all. Can mix over pretty much anything. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Exactly. Let me see. Um, metal filters. I went back to paper filters. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the coffee world is just like everything It's just it's it's too fancy for me. It's, there's just so much going on and it's not like a super big passion of mine, but coffee does. It does help me like I know some people say, yeah, you know, I got to drink three cups of coffee. Nope. I drink one cup and I'm good to go for a while. OK, so let's talk about this stuff. It's already 713. Perfect. OK, so oh wait, what? OK, all right. I just didn't remove a slide. Let me remove that slide. <clears throat> and I was like, "Am I? what did I do? Okay, what is on-prem? On-premises software is installed and runs on computers on the premises of the person or organization using the software rather than at a remote facility such as a server farm or the cloud. So and if, if we were a company, um, and we had servers, we had computers and things that we had services set up on uh, at our own building, at our own place of work. Um, or that would be on premises. Um, and a lot of companies have these things. A lot of people think, you know, I've heard of the cloud and like, oh, everyone's using the cloud. No, uh, and that's not true at all. Um, a lot of people are are utilizing the cloud for certain things, but also have on premises systems. Uh, and, and this can be a requirement for a number of reasons organizations uh it could be for security uh for both physical security as well as uh, network security which maybe uh maybe there are certain protocols and things that amazon cannot put in place um a data security for you know and not uh minimizing data breaches maybe you feel like if you keep it in house you can uh you know you can handle that better than if it was in the cloud uh there are a number of reasons why you might have on-prem stuff, it could be cheaper if you're a larger company or in a lot of instances, uh, if you already have the hardware, if you have access to certain hardware, it may even be cheaper. Um, the only problem is, uh, the, the only real big problem is that you have to manage it yourself, uh, but that's all on-premises is. It is uh, servers and it's, it's hardware, uh, software deployed uh, on, on hardware that you kind of have at your place of work at your this one says on your person but that's kind of weird kind of at your at your place of work 
Um, and so with that, so now that we know that there's something called the cloud, we also know that you can have computing resources on premises, uh, that, that also should mean that you could have a hybrid cloud. So this is a textbook Wikipedia definition. We love to go to Wikipedia first and break it down. And a hybrid cloud refers to a mixed computing storage and services environment made up of on-premises infrastructure, private cloud services, and public cloud, such as Amazon Web Services, AWS, Microsoft Azure, or whatever orchestration platform, whatever. Uh, so it just says, hey, you can set up a, a, a computing environment with a mixture of services and softwares and, and things from different types of, uh, of computing environments, from public clouds, private clouds, uh, on-premises infrastructure, and yeah, the uh, the, the on-prem, I mean, the, the hybrid GIF, it's a Coyote Pike. Um, I don't know, I mean, I don't think it's a real thing. It looks like there's a, looks like there's a, you know, I got this straight off of Giphy and immediately caught my eye. I said, oh, this will catch everyone else's eye. I do remember it not being the only one. I think there were a bunch of these. So I think this thing makes a bunch of these. But what's up, uh, hold, on, hold on, let me pull this up. Pseudo, oh, 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 pseudo, pseudo two. Welcome to the channel. That's uh, that's double pseudo. So you get extra, extra admin access. What's up, uh, Leather Nuke? Welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for the follow. Uh, first off, I didn't, I hadn't checked how many follows we had uh, recently, but at the beginning of this year, um, in January, we had uh, I think we had right under a thousand followers. And I just checked earlier. We have like we were right under four thousand. So maybe I'll make a little road to four thousand, little counter or something. I don't know. People do stuff like that. But I don't be know how to do that stuff. I don't I don't know how everyone knows how to use Twitch so well. But uh yeah, I was just really surprised about that. So uh maybe we'll uh you know do a little countdown, maybe we'll get there faster than we think. Um what's up, uh, Simon Gearing? How you doing tonight? My glasses are like dirty, really dirty. And now I can't, it's weird when you first take your glasses off because I can actually see pretty well um, without my glasses, but it takes a few seconds to kind of adjust. I actually have, um, I don't think I have perfect vision. I have right under, I have right under perfect vision. I only have an astigmatism uh, and that's why I wear the glasses. So I can see, but uh, with the glasses, everything's like a super HD. I remember believing I could see and then I went through the little process of them changing little things on my eyes. And I didn't realize how much better it was getting. And they pulled it away and I was like, I'm blind. I can't see anything. And they were like, you're not blind at all, but the, the, you could get something to help. And so I did. Okay, hybrid cloud. It's a hybrid method of computing using things uh, like the cloud along with something uh, like on-prem uh, environments and infrastructure. And we'll talk a little bit more, a little more deeply about what that means. Uh, usually this means uh, the, the tools and services tonight um, will kind of help foster these hybrid cloud environments um, and really help to uh, to make it easy to work with the cloud in this fashion. So uh, it'll make a little more sense after we touch some of that. So this one is relatively new. Um, and actually I didn't have this in my original slide deck because this is not something that I, well, I knew about it, uh, but it's something that wasn't a part of when I was learning the cloud and learning about on-prem stuff. Like this is it's relatively new. It was, uh, I believe it was released in 2018 actually. And it's called AWS Outpost. And it's basically, uh, it's basically all of Amazon, well, not all of Amazon, but it's basically the functionality of Amazon Web Services on premises. Um, and we're gonna click on this because there were a lot of pieces to it. Um, and I didn't wanna miss anything super important about it. So we're gonna click into this link and check this out because I do think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm not 100% sure where, I was trying to think of through some scenarios in which this would make sense for, like where I would recommend something like this, but uh, I, and I couldn't really think of one, but um, you know, I like I said, I just found out about it, like, like I really dug into it like yesterday, um, but I just found out about it like, maybe like two or three months ago, but run AWS infrastructure and services on premises for a truly consistent hybrid experience. So it looks like, uh, just from the picture, we're just gonna purely judge off of what we see, you know, make guesses. It's fun when you make guesses, you make uh, these hypotheses and you test to see if they're correct. So uh, it feels like they're gonna basically give you hardware um, hardware and software that emulates basically the functionality of Amazon. Uh, but those things that you're doing when you're interacting with EC2, when you're interacting with these things, uh, it's actually doing those things on the servers that you have locally. Um, 
yeah kind of like a it, it, uh yeah i guess like an aws co-location use case i guess uh, i think that's what's happening so i remember in the beginning i also told you that really the cloud is just a it's really just software sitting over top of physical hardware it's just it's it's really a bunch of api layers sitting over top of a bunch of hardware and so i think that's what's happening here i think they're giving you kind of that insight uh there which kind of makes sense it, it's probably pretty easy for them to do to be honest because they have this entire you know aws global infrastructure um they they understand distributed computing and uh really once you've kind of worked out how to how to get these computers networked together to operate kind of a, as one big service um, I, I feel like it's pretty extendable to be able to do something like this. But uh, one interesting thing I thought about it was, was that it was fully managed. Uh, and so what managed services are, and this is, again, this is this is the opposite of what I said, the problem with uh, on-prem servers was is that, you have to, that you have to manage them. Fully managed means Amazon is the one that takes care of the, you know, the maintenance and things of this, of these servers and services. So that sounds really nice to be honest. Uh, I thought that was really interesting when I said it was fully managed. Uh, that extends AWS infrastructure, AWS services, APIs, and tools to virtually any data center, co-location space, or on-premises facility for a truly consistent hybrid experience. So it's basically them saying, hey, wherever your data center is, we are basically gonna extend into that. We are basically going to uh like act like the the hardware and stuff that we give you is uh is is our is our stuff um and so th and then you can utilize those things to do whatever you want to do which i think is pretty cool but like i said i i don't i haven't worked in an environment where i thought this would make sense um at all and so maybe maybe it's not their hardware we're on a dbs infrastructure uh, services on premises this might be really just uh looping in their api layers install aws personal driver outpost to your site connect outpost to power set up network connectivity aws region in your local networks ah oh interesting if i would have just gone lower on here it has some use cases here um i i guess um but it just looking at them and i just did a quick quick little scan these seem like pretty generic um pretty generic use cases that uh that could benefit from something like this but don't necessarily need it but i don't know uh yeah, yeah it seems like it's not their hardware um yeah like i said i just, I, I said purely judging by the image it's in, it's interesting that they would put this image here but um this is interesting i i, I do want to learn a little bit more about this now i know for a fact that this the like anything in particular about outposts is not uh specific about outposts is not on the exam or or at least what it wasn't on the last version of any of the exams um so usually they give a service a couple years uh like usually like a year or two before they start including information about it on the uh on the exams i know that it's not on the cloud practitioner uh they might ask you what it is and they might give you four options or something like that but it's interesting uh but it sounds like it extends uh it extends aws's reach into your data center and allows you to use their apis and their software to manage kind of what you're uh what you're doing but it's interesting that it would be it's interesting that they could say this is a fully managed service but it's on your hardware i think that's very uh, i think it's very interesting azure stack lets you do the same okay and i've seen some stuff about azure stack and i thought it was interesting it's completely integrated with aws services which you can right yeah i just uh, this, this seems weird only aws does almost anywhere anymore but i could be wrong Okay. The extremely low latency, for example, Internet of Things. Yeah. We well, can have your data. So I get the, well, you can't have your data outside the office for legal reasons. I, yes, yes, I get that. I guess maybe because I come from like a systems administrator, systems engineer background, like I don't feel like the things that AWS offers me is enough for me to add that overhead to my system rather than uh, like building out the uh, the setup for that myself. Like, uh, I, I don't know personally that I feel like there's a lot of benefit. Um, yeah, I don't know, it, feel, it feels very interesting to me. I feel like I could set up, I feel like I could be more comfortable setting up something without having, 
I feel like AWS's power is ease of spinning up infrastructure, not necessarily the, their amazing APIs that do cool things, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But again, to each his own, I don't know. I haven't worked in every environment. I, you know, I've, I'm sure I'll run into something one day where this might make sense. So to calculate data transfer, everything gets expensive when you start to calculate data transfer. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's what it is. It kind of extends it into someone's on-prem. So this is like, this is like gives you uh, all of AWS's like services or, or most of them, um, you know, available to you in your data center, in your on-prem uh, place uh, uh, so that you can use their services. So I think it's, I guess it's, I guess it's cool. Um, oof. See, this is, this is interesting. I wanna know, uh, look how, I mean, you can pay one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars right front. See, this is why we need sponsors. We need sponsors because we need to buy. Like, we need to buy this to determine if we need. Like, how do you know if you need something if you can't pay for it for all up front? Like, I want to pay. Oh wait, wait, that's not all, oh, all up front. We need. Excuse me. Um, everyone out on the interwebs, us Mastermind Academy. We need two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars so that we can determine whether or not. Outposts uh, is a thing for us. Now, we also probably need a little bit more money because we need a premises. Right now, we don't have a premises. I have I have this laptop and I have some computers here uh, and my computer is pretty powerful. I guess you can consider it to be a server. Uh, and it, I'm putting this out for the world to hear. And if you would wanna help us learn, if you wanna help uh, us really be able to make sound decisions about architecture, uh, about the cloud, about what we're doing. We need this. And we're asking you for your help, internet. Please uh, give us your money so that we can do this. I appreciate you um, and thank you in advance. I will be looking out for those things. So soon, next time you guys come back, we will try to hop into here because we will obviously have enough money to pay for it all up front. You gotta pay for it up front. We don't need any part. We don't do anything partially here. You go all in, you pay for it up front. You try it out. If you hate it day one, you just, you leave it by the side of the road. Yeah, if we try it and we're like, this is stupid, you know, hey, the money's lost. We gotta walk away from it. I understand, you know, it's, just, it's okay, but we need that money. Appreciate you, MG, for all of, I, oh, what was that? One, two, three, four, five. I can't count one, two, three, four, five. 100 bits thank you so much for the for the cheer i really do appreciate you aws i hope you're listening i definitely um i will i, I so i have an end to some aws account managers so i will uh, i'm gonna be reaching out i'm gonna be reaching out to see what we can do at least give me one you know i understand some of this stuff is prime real estate but maybe we can get something in an you know an underutilized region you know that's all we need and uh we'll try it out so that's um, that's AWS Outpost. Like I said, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and act like I know everything about AWS Outpost because I do not. Uh, I actually completely forgot about it until not that long ago. Um, so <clears throat> came out in 2018, I believe. Um, like close to the end of 2018, they might have announced it at reInvent, and I actually think they announced it as a response to uh, the Azure one. What was it, Azure Stacks or whatever? I think they announced it as a response to that which I think was pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, it's something that you may want to use one day. I've never worked at an organization big enough or secure secure enough to need something like this. All right, now we're into the fun stuff though. This is, uh, I was uh, people were surprisingly excited about this. Uh, and this does, uh, th this product does provide for uh, more functionality for many more companies, many more use cases, but AWS Snowball. AWS Snowball is a data transport solution that accelerates moving terabytes uh, to petabytes of data into and out of AWS using storage appliances. So whenever you see something talk about an appliances, that is physical hardware to do it, uh, designed to be secure for physical transport. So AWS Snowball is an actual physical device. And let's go ahead and take a look at one. AWS Snowball, not Edge. We just want the regular one for now. And it looks like this. That's uh, pretty cool. Um, they're surprisingly, they're, they're a lot denser and heavier than I thought they were. Um, I got I got to pick up and play with them at uh, AWS reInvent and in a few other AWS things as well, but it's a physical hardware device. And so the, what is the problem that it solves? So it says, 
migrate petabyte scale data into the cloud. So we know, we all know now that uh, whether or not you've dealt with it before, but we all know now that data is very, very important. People are collecting it all the time. Uh, and it takes up hard drive space. Uh, data is very, very important. We don't really, we, we're not really smart enough to, re to truly know what to do with data yet, but we know it's important and we keep it around so that once we figure out what to do with it, uh, we can go ahead and process that data. But it's very important, can't lose it. You know, data breaches, uh, you know, are super uh, common right now and they're super detrimental to companies. But when you are a company that's been working on prem and you've been collecting data for years and years and years, and you decide that you want to move into the cloud. How do you do that? Um, the internet is fast, but like, it's really not that fast. Uh, data transfer speeds over the internet. Yes, certain organizations, certain, certain, you can set up, you can get certain pipes set up where you can push tons of data through, but for petabytes and petabytes of data, uh, which is a lot of data, uh, sometimes you need a more secure, speedier solution. So it's actually faster for them to send you basically a giant hard drive. Like that's really what this thing is. It's one big hard drive and they just drop it off to you. Uh, they ship it to you using a, and they put it on the site, a regional carrier. Is it in here? Let me see if it's, uh, I always, it's always interesting that they, they put this in here. Uh, I always find it very interesting. Regional, I don't know why they always say, okay, it doesn't say it here, but they ship it to you via a regional carrier. Um, like, all right, cool, just say you're gonna mail it to me. Uh, they ship it to you, you basically um, hook it into your infrastructure, um, you hook it into your storage, uh, you transfer your data to it, it, it transfers very quickly. Um, in comparison to uh, what, like, I guess what most people can push through a network. Um, and then you ship it to Amazon and they basically plug it back. They, they get, they receive the package. Like, you know, they received it, they plug it in. You got to tell them where to put it. They plug it in, they upload it into the cloud. Um, they upload it into, uh, onto their servers, straight onto their servers, uh, which has their services overlaid. And it's a faster way for, uh, you to move this data. Um, I want to say generally, like you keep it for two weeks or something. Actually, like, here's an example. Let's say you want to move 10 terabytes into us East region. So you pay $200 right up front for 10 days. So for that, you know, 10 days, it's not really two weeks and then 15 days at, uh, per day after and 15 day, $50 days after that. Yeah. So $15 a day after that. Uh, so if you need to move a lot of stuff to the cloud and a time, either time is of the essence or security is a factor because security is usually a factor with data like this. Uh, you, you request one of these, uh, you upload it all to this box. You ship it back to Amazon. They upload it to the cloud for you. It's actually a pretty cool service. Uh, it's the, the, the cost for it, for what it does and what it provides is it's pretty affordable. Um, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of people. I've heard uh, a lot of a lot of really good uh, uh, win stories using this uh, because like think about, I don't know how many of you try to upload big files, but if you have Comcast, um, even at Comcast fastest speeds, even if they're gigabit internet that you can get, you only get 50, uh, megs up. Uh, no, no, you don't need 50 megs up. You get 30 megs up max. And so you might get a little bit more than that uh, at their most, but you may, you get a thousand down, but you get 30 up. For you to upload 10 terabytes of data would take forever on a 30 meg connection. It would honestly take forever on a lot faster connection than that. Um, 10 terabytes is a ton of data. And again, a lot of companies, you know, even, yeah, okay, you got, you got Verizon's, you know, you have Verizon business speed stuff, or even your data center will have faster speeds than your uh, local internet, but you may not be in a premier data center. Uh, and again, your on-prem doesn't mean it's in a real data center and your pipes out may not be that crazy. Um, and so you might want to use a solution like this, but it's pretty cool. I can't even carry that upstairs. It's, it's, uh, it's dense, but it's not, it's not that heavy. Equivalent to an Azure data box. Let's look that up. Um, I don't know a ton about Azure, um, but I'm going to be learning some more about Azure. <laughs> I like how Azure Snowball comes up already. Uh, data box. Does theirs look better? Generally, Azure's uh, UX is better, so I wonder if their hardware design is better. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's it's equally as unattractive as the Snowball, in my in my opinion. Uh, but again, same thing. It's just the same thing. Got a little handle, actually. That might be a little bit better. It looked a little older before I clicked into it a little bit, but interesting. Uh, so cloud providers provide you these things to easily get data into the cloud. So something to know about. I've actually seen, I wish I had known about this when um, I was doing a, uh, a migration 
we were doing a lift and shift though at the time and i just this was my first foray into amazon uh at the company that i was at and we were lifting and shifting from uh on-prem services and servers uh to um we weren't going to no we weren't going to aws they did not have snowball at the time um so i wouldn't have known about it but uh the data like transferring as much data as we transferred was a genuine like it was a nightmare um one because network hiccups uh, can be strong and like how do you account for those how do you account for certain ne network hiccups if you are transmitting terabytes and terabytes of data um making sure like you might say oh you can just you know run a copy and, and it'll copy it on over um now we had to put in all this stuff to ensure you know that we could restart where we left off and uh that we weren't re-uploading stuff and like it was just it was a it was really hectic and something like this would have been great at the time i haven't had a time where we need to do this we might grab one of the, like like just for fun we may grab one of these one day like maybe in the, in the um intermediate class or advanced class i don't know what i want to upload but may maybe we'll take all the gifts and all the memes and all the things that we've been collecting over the years and get this stuff up into the cloud that might be fun just to see how it works i don't even know if i have the necessary hardware to connect to this um but i'm sure i do but as aws snowball it's a it's kind of a fun thing um to be honest uh, it's kind of cool you need to move a lot of data to the cloud securely um quickly uh this is this can be your best your best uh, bet because petabytes of data is are a lot now from the regular snowball we have snowball edge so let's read this and let's talk about this, this is different i had a different understanding of snowball edge uh when it first came out um but we'll cover with i mean i don't know why i had i don't because you know what a snowball is uh i think i applied that logic to the snowball edge but we'll talk about that the aws snowball edge is a type of snowball device but this one has onboard storage and compute power uh, for select aws capabilities so uh well snowball edge can undertake local processing and edge computing work uh workloads in addition to transferring data between your local environment and the aws cloud so the difference here is one that snowball edge um can and may stay at your location it may come to you and stay there and, and, and it may not be that you get it put stuff on it and ship it back it can it can do that it can still it still has the same functionality of the aws snowball but it also has processing units on it has, a, it has it's a basically a computer that they ship to you they basically are shipping you a computer it's got storage and everything and what you can do is you can kind of use this uh how the things in outpost were going to be used you can run certain things like i know it has lambda and some other things and so you can perform uh you know some you can interact with certain services that you may not have access to so uh this can be sent to places that don't have good connectivity or uplink to aws to be able to run certain workloads and these can be shipped there and you can use this as a as a thing as a as a you know a compute device to be able to do the things that you need to do uh, against it so it is pretty cool so it does in fact look the same i think there are some larger ones um for snowball edge and we can see what um we can see what other services come on there. i know lambda comes on there um but okay a little bit smaller a little bit more dense so let's see this one's from 2018. first off it's ruggedized you know because when you're going to the data center you got to make sure you don't get busted and you got to be able to go on long trips over the mountains automated logistics data is always encrypted and secure so you know that's great big capa uh, big storage capacity uh yes it has aws lambda um uh, really fast uh interfaces so if you need to move a bunch of data really fast interfaces um local amazon s3 compatible storage we're going to talk about uh, what something like that is where you um we're gonna get there in a second uh so it says local amazon s3 that sounds weird uh because s3 you know is up in the cloud but local is uh yeah let's talk about that clustering so i guess you can have more than one it's got an nvidia gpu on it uh so um that's one of those compute units um and so that can be used for certain things as well more local ec2 compatibility so it looks like you can do some ec2 stuff on there as well but again snowball it is another physical device that they will ship out to you but this one can stay uh where you are for a while um yeah and you pay for what you need to do with it uh let's see snowball edge 
let's see if we can find pricing never they're never gonna add, I, I i've never seen any pricing questions about snowball or snowball edge um to be honest uh just because it's I, I just don't think it's a it's not a service that they that's at the forefront of what they do it, it it's it's not at the bottom either but it's not at the core of what aws does because again it's it's, it's for select uh it's for a very select client uh, one time setup fee per job order through the console. What does that mean? All right, service 300 extra days. Okay. So again, not very cheap, but to these enterprises, if you have, if you have enough data that you need one of these, that $300 charge plus $30 a day is not going to be anything to you. <laughs> You'll be able to handle that. Uh, I hope you're able to handle that. No problem. Um, if you are, you know, if you need to move that much data, I, I'm assuming you're doing something very important. Um, so yeah, let's see 5.32 years. Whoo. Yes. There we go. See, see, that's, that's, uh, that's a long time. That's a very long time to move. So that's some good, that's a good math there. I'm not going to check it, you know, but, uh, it's some, it's some good magic there. Pretty sure you <laughs> screwed up your maths. Pretty sure you just use like a NAS when you're connecting to the network. Uh, yeah, 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 I think so too. Okay, well then, then I do have everything that I need to connect one. Um, yeah, I was wondering if they provide any other type of special uh, connections to, I don't know, I'm, I haven't worked in data center in a while, but I was wondering if they had anything really cool. A client would be an airplane that needed its own mini. Yeah, they, they usually use that as an example. Um, like an, like air, like this is like a thing that I know Boeing does it. I know they tell, well, at least a cloud guru claims Boeing does it. Um, but they, they've used snowball, uh, edges, um, on flights to calculate certain things and to run workloads against. Um, so yeah, it, it 100% it's, I, I think this makes a little more like, I like snowball edge. I, I can see more use cases for, I, I can see use cases for snowball edge. Um, but not necessarily. I still don't. But I'll post. I still don't get it. Um, but again, but yeah, not cheap. But if, again, if you're Boeing, if you are another company, you know that's that's uh, that's you know for the year it's kind of expensive. But uh, you know, figure it out. Uh, would there be any way we could double check your GitHub is up to date with your latest version? Uh, it's probably not. Um, only because I work between a couple of different computers, it is probably not. Um, we can. Can you ask me a little bit later and we will try, I'll go through and I'll make sure all of my latest stuff is there. I'll, I'll, I'll check between these two computers right here and I'll make sure it has the latest stuff. Enterprise of scale stuff. Yeah, they're like, yeah, I, I, I didn't even understand how much companies are putting out for some of this stuff. It is rare. It's ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's impressive. It's impressive. One day, you know, that's we'll, we'll be there. We'll be there. We'll have the budget to grab some stuff. We're gonna do all of our computing via outposts in this room from a from some service that we built, and uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll get some snowball edges and we'll run some. We'll have some. We will we will no longer be using Twitch. We will be using the Snowball Edge to encode our streams and send it out to whoever we want to send it. It's gonna be amazing. We're gonna be the best whoever did any type of computing ever that's snowball edge so snowball is uh purely for storage snowball edge it does have those storage features as well uh but it is also to allow you to um to run some compute workloads and things against it as well it gives you access to some amazon services and again it's uh, good for places that aren't going to have good connectivity into you know a data center or something like that um to be able to do some processing uh there now the last one the big daddy of them all, the snowmobile, the Amazon snowmobile. So AWS snowmobile is an exabyte. So exabytes much bigger than terabytes and petabytes. Uh, exabyte scale data transfer service used to move extremely large amounts of data to AWS. So very, very like, like there are very few clients in the world who this is a, a necessary tool for, but it is a thing. Um, uh, you can transfer it up to 100 petabytes uh, per snowmobile. Um, a 45 foot long ruggedized shipping container pulled by a semi truck. So this GIF isn't just because it's a lot of data. It's because snowmobile is actually a giant truck. 
um it really is they uh they surprised everyone at one of the reinvents they just rolled up on stage with some 18 wheelers uh which is pretty interesting um and so it is this it is a big snowball you don't need to know anything other than that it's just a it's it's a it's a snowmobile big enough to be pulled by a semi truck uh, and it is to move more data than just a regular snowball it's pretty interesting yeah this is how they pulled up and we're like hey we got this we got this shipping container that we got to pull with a semi and uh you know it's uh it's like cooled it's like a cooled little data center in there um for you to move lots and lots of data into the cloud so um yes so that's very fun so simon i i thought the same question when it first came out um the physical well but I, so i guess the physical security of this isn't much different than say the snowball um uh they, they probably are handling uh yeah i don't i don't know how they're handling physical security i wonder if they have a escort um over to amazon it's pretty interesting i i would wonder that as well uh, i feel like i feel like if i knew you know i'm not saying you know I'm, I'm not saying i've ever planned one of these but if i knew there was a company shipping off you know one of these was going to be leaving a company relatively close to me i'm not saying that i would not plan a you know fast and furious style heist with my friends and maybe family uh to try to extract some of this data now i don't know what we would do with it i don't know where i don't know how we would get it off i only have a 16 gig thumb drive oh no no and i also have a 500 gig uh you know ssd that i could plug in but you know i might if i pull off the right 500 gigs of data you know it might be worth it but yeah I, physical security does seem pretty interesting on something like this it seems like this would be a big target um yeah i mean it seems like this could, this could be a a big target um and it would introduce an an interesting movie idea movie concept idea uh i'll be it, it'll be interesting to hear someone uh talk about a data breach or talk about uh people stealing your data and then you find out they actually like stole a truck um a truck of data and uh we're siphoning it off somewhere um but i don't know i that's a good question pretty interesting maybe that's maybe that's what we'll do maybe we'll get our memes up there with one of those i wonder how much that costs but i mean i'm sure they won't give us a price but let's just see aws snowmobile pricing snowmobile jobs cost just this much based on the amount of provision snowmobile hold on We may, we may be able to afford this. We might be able to afford it. <laughs> Some of the pricing is based on the amount of data stored on the truck per month. So that's the okay. All right. So we can leave the we can leave the stuff there for a while. Made available for use of AWS services. Okay. 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 Let's see. We should do a pricing calculator. Let's see. Total cost of ownership. Um, I feel like this calculator is going to be intense. Uh, and I don't want to do it. I want them just to tell me how much i would have to like can i can i really get, if i have a hundred gigs of data will they send me a truck because if they will i'll pay for it i'll pay for it for the memes i'll pay for it for all that stuff it's just it'll be great like it'll be the best this is oh this is the general storage let's see mm. Oh, uh, please follow it with AWS sales. So, you know, less than five cents per gig per month. And again, they're assuming you're using lots and lots and lots and lots, uh, again, exabytes of data, which we are not. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call and find out. We're gonna call and find out what it's gonna take to get it to us. Oh, that link is definitely broken. This amount of provision mobile storage in the end. Yeah, I but it's got to be it, like, yes, that's the amount of of the storage itself. There's got to be a cost to getting that truck out to you. Like, because if that's the case, I'll order a truck. I'll get a truck here um, and I'll, I'll you know, we can put a lot of gigs on there, uh, you know, if that's the price, but it's got to it's got to cost. That's why they make you contact sales. Because uh, that would be pretty dope. Minimum unit order will be measured for, uh, per truck surely. Yeah, 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 I think it'll be measured per truck. Minimal storage, uh, they won't send you a truck for one gig. I wanna know what the minimum is. That's what I'm trying to say. Like how, cause then we can start saving. We could just start saving and one day we can get us a truck. And again, I don't know what we would do with it. Um, 
again we just collect memes and gifts and uh put it somewhere that'll be i don't know what else to do with it uh because i don't need this much but that's what aws snowmobile is so now you have three physical ways to uh to both perform um you know uh, various aws uh service calls uh locally or on-prem as well as ways to transfer data from on-prem services uh on-premises hardware uh, into the cloud again this is going to be really good if you're trying to do some type of cloud migration and uh you need to get all that data up there to be able to work with um and you just need to move it you just need to get it there so that you can work with it properly um and these would allow you to do that so any questions about those three things before we get on to the next few things Oh, this water's extra refreshing today. Wow. That's nice. Really nice. Okay. Let's stay on it so we can get, like I said, I'm trying to get you out of here at least 20 minutes early. So we'll run through the slides. We'll set up the RDS instance and we'll get up out of here. It'll be a nice way to have an on-prem set up in an area prone to natural disasters. Alert comes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could be. Sooner to handle Delta changes. Uh, what do you mean by Delta changes? All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about uh, for on-prem, I uh, know we're not the last thing, but uh, storage gateway. So this is a hybrid cloud storage service that gives you, um, that gives you on-premises access to virtually unlimited cloud storage. So uh, if, the goal is not necessarily to dump all the stuff in the cloud and work with it there. Um, storage gateway allows you to set up uh, something in between you and the cloud. Uh, and really what it does is it kind of caches the local storage. And then when it can, when it, it, it'll, it'll do its job to put it in the cloud as well. So it's cached locally so that your on-prem services can grab that data quickly. Uh, and then it's, it's basically copied up to the cloud uh, so that it's there as well. Um, it can be physical or virtual. So physical or virtual simply means uh, it can be a physical uh, server itself, or it can actually be a virtualized server as well. You can set up a gateway as a, like a, like a virtual machine. You can set up a server uh, to be your storage gateway. And again, it'll basically, for all intents and purposes, it'll, it will cache your files with all the storage will happen locally uh, at your data center on-prem. Uh, and it will copy those things to the cloud, but they'll be cached locally so that you can uh so that when your workloads and your servers that are running locally need to get that data they can get them quickly uh so it works it works in an interesting way it almost kind of works uh it's it's a little bit like the cloud front paradigm uh not that it's geographically distributed but that uh kind of uh the way that it works with kind of the time to live stuff and uh files that are accessed frequently will be there uh much more it, they'll be cached for longer and uh, it, if something is not cached locally it will go retrieve it from Amazon through the storage gateway and bring that down. But, you know, if it's not cached locally, that will increase the amount of time it takes for you to be able to retrieve uh, retrieve data. So again, and it says it gives you virtually unlimited cloud storage again, because the cloud gives you virtually unlimited cloud storage, uh, the storage gateway essentially gives you access to basically unlimited cloud storage, which is really nice. So uh, you can use uh, this, you don't need to have the same amount of local storage that you do in the cloud for this, uh, even though it says the cache is files locally. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just, you need to, basically you need to have as much storage as the amount of frequently accessed files that you have. But yeah, your data moves in between, they send out the device until, oh yes, yes, yes. Great, uh, so th these are more concepts that we will cover um, probably in the intermediate sections. Uh, I. I I love when people bring up things like this because I think it sparks a little bit of uh, I try to avoid them, but I love when you bring them up because these are things people don't think about. So what Simon's talking about everyone is if I work for a company and we're running an application and it's taking in data, it's constantly taking in some data, uh, you know, the application is live and we want to start to move, make the move to the cloud. Unless you shut that application down completely until the whole move is done, what happens is this snowball comes to us on a Monday. People are still, you know, operating on this application. Basically, when I start moving, I might start copying things on Tuesday, comes in Monday, Tuesday, we start transferring stuff to the snowball. 
maybe it's maybe it doesn't even finish until wednesday um and so all of that tuesday while things were transferring uh basically that's kind of orphan data uh not orphan data but that's data that's not going to be transferred to the snowball uh, unless we go back and transfer it there but even once we do that the time that it takes for me to send this back to amazon and for them to get it up to to the cloud so maybe i ship it back on a maybe i ship it back on a wednesday they get it on thursday and they don't have it uploaded to the cloud until sunday or monday um all that time my application is still collecting data it's still gathering information and so i need to account for how to move that data now into the cloud now that might be fine because that's a couple of days of data. Maybe it is useful to just use, you know, maybe now it's feasible to just transfer that data over the internet. Now, if it's, if it's, if it's because of security, uh, then now you've got yourself a whole different problem and you probably should have done this in a different way. But yes, it is something to think about. These are all things that you learn over time to think about when you are thinking about how to, especially manage data. Data management is probably one of the most interesting pieces uh, uh, of, of, any type of solution architecting, uh, to be honest. But yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to bring up. <laughs> unlimited, bring it home. It's just vir virtually, virtually unlimited. Oh, you got a million petabytes? Hey, I mean, if you have a million petabytes, you should have a lot of money because someone will pay you for some of that data. Uh, people, I don't know what that data is, uh, but someone will pay you for some of it. Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, keep, no, 100% Simon, keep, keep bringing those things up. Keep talking about those things. Um, just trying to keep it uh the reason the reason we're not diving super deep into the intricacies into these things is because this is a kind of an apprentice level course it's designed to kind of cover the uh things that are going to be on the uh certified cloud practitioner exam and then we'll, be, we'll actually be doing two more levels of this course at intermediate and advanced uh but no 100 percent without like bring those things up i think a lot of times uh in context there those things are perfect so yeah now we're just having fun talking about some stuff bring up anything and everything um yeah, I actually think that's a I actually think that's a good thing to start calling out as people are learning. And that's why that's why people care about experience so much, because it like those are things you just don't think about. Uh, and people have lost a lot of money not thinking about things like that. Um, you know, you, you you know that you need to move data, you know, you're like, hey, I know that there's this thing that we can use to do it and you go do it and everyone's like yeah this is great excellent and then you get you know you get there and you're like oh no we've basically you know we basically lost two weeks orphan two weeks of data like what do i do with it and usually you know usually there's a way to figure that out but uh it's just another real-time issue that you generally have to solve so the more that you can think about up front uh the better things are and wow that is intense hello lana Welcome tonight. Uh, first off, let's give a shout out to Lana. Lana does super dope uh, game development. Um, I was pretty impre impressed. I, I was watching the other day. I, I, I lurk in there a lot, um, but your game seems scary to me. It seems scary when I was watching. I was like, oh no, this is uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, but welcome to the channel, Lana, with the giant raid. Welcome. Come on in, everybody. Uh, come on into our sweet, sweet academy. We are learning. Um, we're on, uh, you, you, you joined on a night that is Horizons. This is uh, cloud computing, uh, introduction to cloud computing with Amazon Web Services. We do tech training boot camps here. We do, uh, uh, we do something called Decoded on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which is an introduction to computer science and software engineering. On Saturdays, we do something called Pipelines, which is an introduction to software, uh, software de delivery, uh, infrastructure and automation as well. This is kind of a DevOps SRE course. So we try to highlight the different skills, the different things that go into uh, you know, the tech industry, all the things that go into digital software delivery because you can make a lot of money doing it and because it's fun. But welcome so Oh, so much. Well, well, thank you so much. Welcome to the channel. It scared me and I didn't mean for it to be. Ah, no, uh, oh, that's fair. I, I was I was going to try to find out, like, was it supposed to be a scary game? Uh, but it looked cool. It looked fun. I it was pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, let me do the shout out real quick. I can't type. I know you can't see. Oh, yeah, you can. You can actually see. Did I do it right that time? There we go. Appreciate it. But like I said, Lana does game dev every day. First off, I respect your grind. Uh, I, I, every day is pretty wild. She does it every day for a long time too, actually. So I wish I got her channel. Um, like I said, I lurk in there a lot, especially that we're home now. Um, I actually spend a lot of my time on Twitch uh, now, like maybe more, more than I should. 
but i really do appreciate the raid welcome welcome everybody we're going to continue because i told everyone they would get some of their time back tonight so we're going to run through the rest of the slides tonight and then we're going to be spinning up um a database uh we're going to be using amazon's managed database service tonight called rds and we'll spin up a database maybe we'll try to set up a wordpress site or something and have a little fun with that okay the next thing is code deploy so code deploy is a de deployment service that automates application deployments to amazon ec2 instances on-premises services serverless lambda functions or amazon ecs so not crazy important that you memorize all those things code deploy has a great name because it's very descriptive so code deploy is simply a service that helps you deploy code that's all you need to know right now um if you are uh, it, it's really kind of a ci tool uh ci cd tool uh so if you're in the pipeline stuff if you're familiar with some of those things it's just a tool to help you deploy code and to help and to help automate that code deployment so your developers uh, write code if lana is building her game and she's writing code and she needs to get it out somewhere she needs to package it up and get it to a place so that uh it can be delivered to everyone people can go download it get it out to steam she could use something like this code deploy uh tool that amazon has so that is something that you can actually deploy locally you can actually install this on-prem and you can actually use it to deploy things on-prem as well so just something good to know about code deploy be familiar with the name again it does like I promise you if they ask you anything about code deploy on the certified cloud practitioner exam uh, you will know the answer because again the name is very descriptive and they probably won't though this one's a little uh deeper uh, ops works um and i'll tell you why this gif is here on the right not it, it 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 makes sense that it's there but ops works is a configuration management service that provides managed instances of chef and puppet now we actually might switch uh, th there's a Beanstalk Lab on on Monday. On Monday, we're doing a, an Elastic Beanstalk Lab. We may switch that to an OpsWorks Lab. Uh, and actually, I think there's a there's a number. I mean, they they go hand in hand as well. Um, but it may be almost purely an OpsWorks OpsWorks Lab. Um, I'm gonna take a look at what they're delivering on the test right now to make sure I understand what that is. But AWS OpsWorks is a configuration management service that provides managed instances of Chef and Puppet. The word Chef is in there. Chef is a tool. Uh, as you can see, he is obviously a chef. He's cooking. Uh, whether or not the apron is appropriate, uh, you know, you got to be in your right element. You, you got you to gotta look good, to feel good, to perform well. So the chef is just, you know, being comfortable. You know, we're surprising him. And, you know, he's just making us a little uh, spaghetti or whatever he's making. But Chef is in fact something called a configuration management tool and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, but what opsworks basically does y'all know all the t all the stuff that we did on monday with the load balancers and manually going into each one of those and installing nginx and downloading things and getting keys set up and all that stuff what if i told you uh you could uh, there are tools to basically manage lots of servers all at once by writing a bit of code. So you write, a instead of logging into a bunch of servers, you write configuration files to what the server should look like. You describe in a file what the server should have on it, what services should be running, uh, users, things like that, that should be installed on it. And then you run that against a server and it just sets it all up for you. Chef and Puppet are these configuration management tools. They configure these servers for you. They're really nice. They're really cool, uh, really good uh, products. Uh, Chef, um, I, I have, I actually have a fair amount of experience with Chef, uh, a little bit with Puppet, um, but they're pretty cool tools. And I think it's gonna be fun to kind of get hands on and see how easy that is. Actually, let me show you a little bit of what, uh, uh chef cookbook um let me sh see if i can show you cookbook install nginx since we've installed nginx a bunch of times maybe seeing this bit of code may um may make sense to you I'm like oh that's that's kind of easy so we'll see if we can uh find a good example really quick all right so let me make this a lot larger check this out so in chef um again i can define once i can define uh if we want to set up a web server and i say hey i need to have nginx installed i need to have it started and running um and i can even have like place files there so like the nginx config all you got to do to install nginx on a server you set up a little bit of code like this and then every server that you basically run this against will go ahead and make sure nginx is installed what will also happen is um 
it will this the, the the thing that you set up the code that you describe the state that you say the server should be in um chef will check that every so often uh, it'll check it on the interval so every you know every 20 minutes every 30 minutes i think 30 minutes is the default um it'll run against these servers so maybe i have 200 servers um that are supposed to be running nginx uh, with a certain configuration it'll run against it and said hey is nginx still installed yep we're good is nginx running so maybe if i manually went in and i was trying to test something and i shut nginx off or maybe nginx died on the server it'll say hey is nginx running nope let me make sure you said you wanted it running i'll make sure it's running for you and it'll start nginx and then here it'll make sure hey uh that there's a file here there's an index.html file here uh so it'll set all these things up for us uh, automatically so basically all the stuff that we've been doing manually in those ec2 instances you can automate this product process with a tool like chef or puppet with a configuration management tool and basically all ops works is is a managed uh, version of one of those tools these tools are open source actually let me share those with you a little bit uh chef and and puppet uh they're open source check them out uh they have paid versions as well but you can actually do these yourself uh you don't need uh any of this stuff uh you don't need to use ops works um or anything like that but you can check it out you can start to learn it uh it is it's uh these this is one of the big devops tools i don't necessarily i try to avoid that uh, these tools are great they are great but i'm a big fan of uh and maybe this is a little like I'm a fan of not doing runtime configuration. So anyone in Decoded knows that when we talk about runtime, we are talking about uh, when the code or application is it, it runs, when it starts. Uh, I like to pre-configure my servers uh, uh, with a, either a golden image or I like to have everything on there before it runs rather than configuring it when it runs. These tools, basically you spin up a server already and then once the server's up, then you configure it. I like to get everything installed and set up beforehand, but when you start it, it has everything ready. Again, everything doesn't work that way. Everything doesn't work well within that paradigm. But uh, so I've, I've, I've moved away from things like Chef and Puppet and Ansible um, in, the, in the things that I try to do, um, but there's still a place for them 100%. Uh, they're still used heavily in a lot of places. Um, very important skill to learn is, uh, is some type of configuration management tool like OpsWorks. And so like I said, we'll learn a little bit of that, but just know that OpsWorks will just help you configure a server. It'll help you configure a server automatically. And knowing that it uses Chef and or Puppet uh, is pretty important. Okay, we'll stop there for a second. We'll take a little a little breather there. Um, one, I'll say hello to everyone who just joined. I'll try to go through your names in a second. I'll follow up. Um, but again, just welcome in everybody. I really appreciate the raid, Lana. Um, but we're gonna dive into the databases in a little bit. I'm gonna grab a little bit of water. Does anyone have any questions so far about any of the on-prem services that we talked about? Again, Snowball, which is that storage device that allows you to ship it out to you. You dump your data to it and you ship it back to them. They put it in the cloud for you. Makes it easy, uh, makes it secure uh, to ship your data to the cloud. Snowball Edge, which um, does has similar functionality, but it also allows you to perform some compute uh, workloads against it. Uh, it gives you things like Lambda and EC2 uh, kind of provisioning there that you can run some things against it. Uh, it's it's made for places that don't have great uh, data center capacity, great upload links and things like that aren't gonna be super operational from a data center. Again, the, the Boeing planes is kind of the main one that people use for that, but generally done in kind of remote locations a little bit uh, to allow you to still do a lot of that stuff. Um, and we talked about Snowmobile, which is basically for exabyte level data transfer. If you are a giant company that has tons and tons and tons and tons of data, and you need to get it to the cloud or to be able to operate with it with, within the cloud services, they will ship you a shipping container on a truck, on, a, on an 18 wheeler, and uh, they'll come, you'll, you'll plug it in, get your data in there, and they can take it back to Amazon and get that stuff uploaded as well. Storage gateway, uh, where you can have a physical or a virtual uh, device um, that can be a gateway between you and Amazon and basically allow you to cache data for your local on-premises servers and devices and, uh, and, and applications and things to be able to access, um, but it'll transfer that data up into the cloud and it'll, it'll handle the, the transmission of those things and basically give you the storage capacity of the cloud, which is virtually unlimited. Um, 
And then we just learned about uh, OpsWorks and Code Deploy. Code Deploy helps you deploy code. It helps you automatically deploy code. You can do it in the cloud or you can do it on-prem. And then OpsWorks, which is the configuration management, it helps you automatically uh, uh, it helps you automatically configure servers uh, using Chef or Puppet. Cool. What's up, uh, Cookie around the bend? Welcome. What's up, Lastin? What's up, Patrick? How you doing, uh, Bods eighty one? Jeff Dominguez, Jeff Jeffro. I like that. Jeff, no, Jeffro. D Jeff Rodriguez. I can't read. Wow. Had to try it a couple of different times. You know, it's okay. We figured it out eventually. What's up, Returner? What's up, uh, Mister Syntax? Welcome, Whitcode. Just as good, Joe. What's up, Rabbit? How you doing, Bud the Pit? Lana, again, thank you for the raid so much. Really do appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. Do you do SQL or no SQL database as well? I'm glad that you asked that because, oh, never mind. I thought the next slide was gonna have it. This slide didn't have, did have both. We'll talk about both of them. I'm a fan of no SQL databases. I'll give you that, that to you right up front. You know, I don't like to make you wait. Um, I'm a fan of no SQL databases. Um, but we're going to be talking tonight. We're going to be using a SQL database. We're going to be using a relational database tonight. Uh, not, we're not going to dive super deep tonight. Tonight, I'm, tonight, I'm not going to be teaching you SQL. Uh, but I just want you to kind of just get your hands on, get to start to feel again some more of the AWS services uh, for the exam for uh, the certified cloud practitioner exam. Uh, they'll ask you uh, basically about RDS, like kind of what it is, um, and then they might ask you one of one or two of the key features, which I'm gonna to give to you. I don't think I have them in the slides. Maybe we'll make a quick slide really quick, um, but they will not, they're not gonna ask you anything super deep about RDS. It's just gonna be fun to kind of get hands on with them. But databases, I dislike databases, period. Uh, they're great, you need them, very important. But what is a database? A database is a uh, systematic collection of data. And so that's really the term right there. It's, it's a systematic collection of data think uh, I think the the common way people will describe it is think about your uh, think about Excel sheets uh, think about those rows and those columns uh, and how you structure that data um, that's basically what it is databases support storage and manipulation of data databases make data management easy so that's the goal of a database is to be able to structure data and to be able to manage it easy uh, so it's a systematic collection of data and you know, you interact with databases nonstop, all day, every day. Um, the data that, you know, when you log into a website and what it's getting back and all that stuff, uh, it's you're utilizing databases every day. And there are basically two different, uh, there are more than this actually, but there are basically two different um, uh, styles of database. Uh, and this has to do with the way the data is systematically structured. So one, relational databases, SQL. SQL. Uh, what does SQL stand for? Is it is it is it a redundant uh, acronym or is it is it structured query query language? Let's see. SQL uh, meaning or is it a yeah, structured query language? Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but I just wanted to tell you what it was since I put it in parentheses up top. But relational SQL. Think think you should be thinking of structured query language SQL. You've probably heard that before, but. This type of database uh, management system defines database relationships in, form, in the form of tables, also known as relations. So relational databases uh, really care about the relationship between data pieces. So they use rows and columns uh, and they set up relationships between those things so that you can get information out faster. Uh, you use SQL, so you use structured query language to query the data. So what is querying the data? Uh, that means if you want to get uh, specific information out of your database, maybe uh, I have, maybe I have a database that has all of you as users. It has your username, so it has your name, which is your username. Maybe it has your age um, in there as well. Maybe it has uh, your state, the state that you live in, and maybe it has the length of time that you've been a user on Twitch. Uh, what, what SQL allows you to do uh, it allows you to do things like find out, um, it allows you to return which users have uh, 
are older than 25 or something like that. And I can go in and I can uh, query my database. I can, I can basically request information from my database with certain parameters that fall in certain bounds and it will give me that data back because the data is structured, because the data is related. I can also do things like, uh, you know, cross sectional queries and I can like take information from one table and another table and then uh, mash things together and I can basically uh, get information out of the database that I need using this uh, structured query language, um, which is really great. It's pretty fast because of the way the data is, uh, is managed, uh, but it's got a couple problems. One is that it can be very difficult to scale, very difficult to scale. Actually, what is scale? We talked about, we've talked about this before, but as your site grows, as more requests are coming, uh, uh, scaling up your database to be able to, uh, be able to, to, to I guess, uh, satisfy the amount of requests and processing that it's getting uh, can be pretty tough. Um, redundancy is tough. It's really annoying as well uh, because the, of the way the data that this data works. Um, relational databases are, I believe, something called uh, ACID compliant. So ACID compliance. Um, and so this has to do with, yes, it, it has to do with properties of, um, of a transaction of these database transactions. Um, I'll share this. I'll put this in the Google classroom, um, uh, to kind of go over it and maybe I'll, I'll post a video on acid, uh, as well. Um, but because this is transactional, um, basically, uh, the, the way that the data is stored, the way the data is retrieved, uh, it, it it's. It, it can be hard to, because of the state the data is in, it can be hard to um, uh, transition that state to another computer or something like that. Um, so again, it can be difficult to, you might say, why can't I just throw more servers at it? Can't really throw more servers at it um, because of the way the data is read. And again, we'll, we'll dive deeper into all that. That makes more sense when you're actually looking at it uh, than when you're not. So just know that SQL is probably what you've, if you've heard about databases, this is probably what you heard of. This is probably what you're most familiar with. Um, they teach SQL in a lot of schools. It, you can learn structured query language uh, in a couple of hours, or at least, at least the basics of it. Um, it takes a while to get good at it, um, to get really good at it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'll tell you right now, I'm very average at putting, at writing, uh, you know, writing complex queries pretty average. Um, and I've been doing this for a while, been dealing with databases for a while. I know how to manage the services. I know how to set up scalable, uh, you know, scalable databases and, and resilient and fault tolerant database structures more than I know how to write uh, good queries. Um, but you can learn the basics of SQL in just a couple hours. It's, it's, it's pretty cool to know. And it's super valuable to know, um, 100% valuable, but that's relational data. Uh, it's it's kind of cool. It's the the kind of standard. It was made a long time ago. Uh, it was made a very long time ago for the way that computing was done, you know, when it was when it was created. But while it's great for that, while it is really good, um, times have shifted, and the way that we interact with certain things, the way that computing has changed, uh, has opened up a new paradigm called NoSQL. And you might be like, "Wow, there's a whole form of databases called SQL that that use SQL." Um, that are relational. Then we have this thing uh, called NoSQL. Uh, and so a lot of people think that means no structured query language, but that's uh, that's not true. Um, it's not true at all. Uh, it means not only SQL. Um, it means not only SQL. So that's interesting. I did not know uh, NoSQL is older than uh, SQL. That's very interesting. Um, but whether that may, that, that's interesting because NoSQL is, uh, it, it was far ahead of its time then, because uh, like I said, the way that date, the way that the internet has shifted, the way that we gather data, the way that we interact uh, with these technologies makes it uh, pretty interesting. But uh, that, that's interesting. I didn't know it was older. Um, but uh, it stands for not only SQL. Um, so it has unstructured or a dynamic schema. So uh, one of the problems with with SQL is you have to define the schema. You have to define the structure of the data. Uh, and, it's, and that schema is very important uh, and it's, it's pretty finicky as well. Uh, so you, and everything has to fall in those bounds of the schema that you set up. Again, I have to tell the database that, hey, I'm gonna have information about your name, your age, uh, where you're located and how long you've been on Twitch. Um, but uh, NoSQL allows for a little more uh, 
dynamicism. I don't even know if that's a word, but it sounded right. D dynamicity is, uh, is, is another one that I'm gonna make up on the spot. Sure, you don't make up words here, but it allows for a dynamic schema, uh, unstructured dynamic schema. So it's a little bit easier to uh, work with on the fly. Um, it, it allows you to uh, manipulate data in a different way. Uh, it's horizontally scalable. So vertical, ver vertically scalable is bigger, more powerful servers. Horizontally scalable is basically more servers to process what you're doing. So more servers the same size. So if I have one server of a medium size, horizontally scaling it will be giving me more of those behind a load balancer. Uh, it's, hor it's, it's, it's horizontally scalable, um, uh, really horizontally scalable. So it allows for, um, you know, massive amounts of data to be transferred quickly, um, but it's not good for complex queries. So relational databases are much better for complex queries and much faster for complex queries. If the data that you're trying to receive uh, needs, uh, it, it's very precise and it needs to go through and traverse lots of different pieces of data to be able to get to the things that you want. Uh, NoSQL is not as quite as good for that as relational databases or SQL. Um, and so that's kind of the that's kind of just the, the basics of what you need to know about these. Um, they're as as in as a systems guy, as a you know an ops as an ops guy, you know gone DevOps and gone to the place where I'm operating on an application development team. Uh, I when I found out about NoSQL and I started. I knew about it, but I didn't really do much with it because people were, weren't adopting it yet, uh, or at least the projects and things that I was on weren't adopting it yet. But when I got to develop against uh, getting data from a uh, from a NoSQL database and, and managing the data with, with inside of it, um, it was great. Uh, it, it, for me, and what makes things easy for me, um, I really liked it a lot. Um, like I said, I don't, RDS is great. SQL is great. I just am t I just don't like managing it. They can be so finicky, uh, super duper finicky. And I guess so can NoSQL t tables and stuff as well. But these are just your two types of things. It'll, as you're messing with things and as you're learning things, you'll start to see why you love one over the other. I know plenty of people, uh, plenty of devs who love SQL. I, again, love hate thing. This is why I don't like Jenkins. If you spend a lot of time managing something that's tough to manage, uh, you will learn to hate it. Uh, so that's kind of how I feel. GraphQL is SQL for no SQL. That's interesting. That is very interesting. Um, I'm actually gonna be uh, diving into uh, Gatsby and GraphQL a little bit deeper. Um, I, 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 we've been using them a bit and we're trying to do a pretty big proof of concept on something. Um, so I'm gonna be spending like two days or so diving into uh, really, like I understand what GraphQL, I understand what problems it solve, and I've I've used it to do little things, but I really want to dive in and really understand it. And I guess that's an interesting way of putting it. You know, it's a great skill to have if you're looking for a job in the market. Yeah, like like SQL is a, is an excellent excellent skill to have. <clears throat> but the name No SQL was coined in the early 21st century. Interesting. Ah, uh, cool. Learn something new today. Um, I'll put that on my what I learned today thing. MPB databases are relational databases and horizontally scalable. What's uh, what is MPP? Um, SQL is useful if you need to show relations between objects. Uh, I think that is true. Um, that's true. Again, when relationships are key, um, then SQL databases are much better. They really are. They they are like for what they're good for. They're really good for. Um, so yeah. I think it was pretty much the opposite, so it depends on your type of project, 100%. Um, Modern SQL Server has some support for JSON documents and simple NoSQL scenarios. That's, I also did not know that. That's good to know. Um, do you know which ones in particular? Um, like does MySQL or Postgres have the ability to do that? That's interesting. Um, I, I, might wanna, I might wanna check that out because I'm trying to figure out how to manage some data, to be honest. And uh, this is definitely one of my, like security is probably my, I mean, Networking is probably my like weakest area. Networking for sure, or my weakest area. And then I would probably say data management is my, well, data design, like the design of data management is probably my second weakest area. Uh, not necessarily the data management piece of it. I'm pretty good at at, at that and knowing how to do that properly, but uh, the design of it, uh, something I need to work on. <laughs> SQL is a TypeScript of databases. Uh, I, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, SQL would be good for a dating site. It would be very good for a dating site. 
Okay, so let's hop in. Um, actually, let's talk about some services really quick and then we'll hop in and we'll try to build one. What time is it? Are we still making good time? We are still making good time. So I should get you out of here early. So uh, RDS is Amazon service that handles relational databases. So there's a number of database services. Uh, RDS is the one that handles relational databases. So that should make it easy for you. As soon as you see relational database, you should be thinking what? You should be thinking SQL, SQL is exactly what you should be thinking. Um, and so that it's gonna handle this top half up here. Um, this is what it's gonna cover. Um, but it's fully managed, which is nice. And we're talking about why that's really nice. Uh, it's scalable uh, relational database service uh, and it supports the following types of databases. We'll go over those a little bit, but uh, fully managed again, it just means that you do not care about the underlying servers or anything like that. Um, all you have to worry about is your data and the configuration, the connection to it. So basically, instead of, uh, you know, we could spin up our own MySQL server, no problem on an EC2 instance, we're gonna install MySQL, configure it, everything's great. Um, but then we've got to one, keep it patched, keep it up to date. We've got to manage, you know, the version of MySQL. We've got to get everything set up. We got to worry about the networking and all that stuff. Um, and we, you know, it, it, it's really is a hassle. Um, but RDS allows you to very easily um, do that. They basically, you basically say, hey, I want a database and they basically just give you an endpoint to connect to. That's basically what happens. Uh, and then you have some nice uh, replication functionality underneath. Um, database replication is pretty, uh, it can be, it's really annoying to set up by hand. Um, and they give you some nice features again for, for kind of scaling and for reliability and fault tolerance as well. But it supports, the following databases. So Aurora, Aurora is Amazon's um, implementation basically of MySQL. MySQL is probably uh, probably still the most popular open source relational database. Um, so we'll go there first, we'll look at MySQL, um, which now MySQL is a, uh, people, a lot of people are using the drop in replacement, it's called MariaDB. Um, but MySQL is kind of what people will talk about. It's their 25th anniversary. Uh, but open source database, uh, pretty cool. Uh, maybe it's not open source. I'm pretty sure it's what is it open source. Let's see. Um, pretty sure it is. It's free. I know that Enterprise Edition. They have an Enterprise Edition. They have like a community uh, edition. But um, yeah, MySQL. Um, Aurora is Amazon has a basically a MySQL compatible. Aurora. Um, it, it's basically something they've built in house and uh, it's compatible with most both MySQL and Postgres. We'll talk about Postgres in a second, uh, but it's something they've built um, and the way that they've built it has allowed it to be super performant uh, within their within their cloud and compatible with the things that you're used to. Uh, and because of that, they uh, the the advantage of it is that though you you can it's cheaper you can pay less for it because of how efficient they've made it. Um, they were able to make it within their systems. It's something that you can only use within their systems. I'm pretty sure I uh, can't really use it anywhere else. You got to use it here. Um, so yeah, performance and availability of commercial grade databases at one tenth the cost. Uh, I can attest to Aurora is a absolutely a MySQL drop in replacement. Um, and again, it's cheaper. You can get it for a lot cheaper. Uh, but all these database engines, again, they they just manage your data in a different way. Um, we're not really gonna talk about the differences between them. Uh, these are just some of the popular ones. MySQL is very popular. Uh, MariaDB is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. Uh, Postgres, which is a different database service, uh, is very popular as well. Um, do you guys, so, Postgres, let's talk about Postgres real quick and what you say when you come to Postgres. Do, do you say Postgres SQL or do you say PostgreSQL? I need to know uh, because I need, yeah, I need to know. <laughs> um, it's always it's always an argument. It's always an argument with people, uh, Postgres SQL or Postgres SQL. I just say Postgres uh, to be honest, but um, when seen here, it obviously should look like, it looks like Postgres SQL, but um, I've seen it written without a second S. Like here, look at this, uh, look at this. Oh no, no, this one doesn't have it either. Never mind, it doesn't have the second S, yeah. So Postgres is what most people, what most people call it. Um, 
Yeah, just Postgres. But uh, <laughs> Postgres SQL. Ah, that sounds. PostgreSQL sounds weird as well, but like to me that sounds cleaner. Flows a little bit better. PostgreSQL. Um, but Postgres, yeah, it's another open source database. It works uh, differently than MySQL. Uh, they are different. Uh, learning to manage them is interesting, but it's another relational database. And again, you just need to know how to. Uh, it's a way to help you manage your data and structure your data. And uh, yeah, it, it it works really well. Uh, Oracle, don't, uh, I did not know RDS supported Oracle. Maybe I did, and I just didn't think about it. So Oracle has, uh, people pay a lot of money. Uh, organizations, particularly the government, pay still pay a ton of money for Oracle database services, which they do not need a licensed Oracle database. It's old, it's outdated. Um, I mean, I'm sure they have up-to-date versions, but it's like, it's not something that you should choose to use. Uh, I, I just I just don't think that anyone is is like doing new projects and it's like, yeah, we're gonna use Oracle database to do this. I just, I just, I've never, I've never actually heard anyone say, we're using Oracle, we're using Oracle for our databases and someone not immediately go ill, like that's gross, why? So um, it is there, um, but like no one's, yeah, it's there. It's there for you. And then SQL Server. So SQL Server is Microsoft's server. And SQL Server is SQL Server is good. It's a good product. Um, it is. It, it, it honestly, it's a good product. Uh, as much as people hate Microsoft's uh, enterprise offerings, um, it's it's something that you may use. Um, it's a good product. I don't I don't currently use it for anything. But if you need to, uh, SQL Server is there, and you can use it. It's it's pretty cool. Use Oracle and I have a love hate relationship with them. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, so yeah, the, what what kind of projects does Oracle make uh, quite good good sense? Is it for, for data warehousing? I, is it just good at data warehousing? It, like, does it make sense for new, for any new product? I don't know, I just, I don't know. I, maybe I can, I've, I've never, I've never used it heavily. I've worked at places where I had to do a little bit of the management of it, uh, which is always problematic. Um, but is the is the data warehousing that good? There are other data warehousing tools that are more modern, I feel like, for that. But uh, yeah, okay. All right, all right. I, I'm, I, maybe, maybe if anyone out there from Oracle would like to come tell us why your product is great, I will listen, but I'm still gonna give you crap the whole time because, uh, I have, I have, I have, uh, I have interesting thoughts about, uh, what you guys have done with certain products and kind of how some of your products work. I, I don't know. Also Oracle, like Oracle licenses are absurdly expensive, but it ain't my money. I wouldn't pay for it, but, uh, organizations do. Uh, it is this, it is the same Oracle that made Java. Yes. Same company. Um, what is it? The, you know, the big red Oracle. That is not it. This Oracle, yes, it is in fact this red Oracle, and you can uh, maybe we'll just maybe we'll stop being mean, and maybe we'll check them out. So I, I went to one of their booths at um, at one conference. I, I think I went to a software engineering conference, like a, a O'Reilly uh, software architecture conference, and they had a booth there, and they were talking to me about their cloud, which I thought was interesting. Um, they have their own cloud infrastructure as well. We're learning about the cloud. Maybe we'll check them out one day. Um, Maybe, who knows what the future holds. <clears throat> yes, I do know that Oracle also obtained my SQL not too long ago. I do know that. Amazon SQL offering is interesting as it sits between Azure SQL DB single database and Azure SQL server. Huh, interesting. Interesting, yeah, I, I've never used it for SQL server. Um, that is very interesting. I, I would like to dive into that more. Okay, uh, and the other offerings, uh, so we'll, we'll we'll stick it there. Um, they do have other database offerings. Let's get logged into Amazon real quick. Um, the biggest one of which they'll push a lot. It's on all the exams. It's, uh, they'll ask you about all the exams. They really like to do it. This is, uh, oh, this is my personal account. The one that I don't use because yeah, this is not it. <clears throat> I actually was trying to close it and they wouldn't let me close it because I think I owe them like $9 um, and I will pay them eventually. Um, but this is not the 
right account. How do I log out? Um, am I logged into the wrong thing? Let me go here then. Let's get logged in to console to Amazon root user. Hey, Brooks at mastermind.io. Let's see, log in. Where's my phone? Let's get the authy login. Where is it? Six, eight, four, five, two, seven. Oh, okay. No, I do not want to add my mobile phone number. Not now. I don't want to. Oh, you know what I did not do last time? Ugh. I don't think I cut these servers off. That's fine. No big deal. Gross. I'm gonna get rid of some of these. Uh, we're not gonna need any of these. Actually, we're, let's leave one of them up tonight. We'll leave web one up. I'll make this larger, I know it's tiny. Um, let's shut these off though. Okay, so RDS, actually first the other database uh, services, uh, DynamoDB is the big one that they'll push a lot. This is their no SQL offerings. Uh, you probably have a $7 bill. Oh yeah, I definitely have a $7 bill. Uh, probably now, uh, I think I just paid my, I think I just, um, I, this one's on auto pay. Let's see what I, let's see what I owe right now on this one because bills, uh, it's up to $13. And like I said, I think I just paid. It's all, see, it's all EC2, but they're shut down. So it's all right. I think my last bill was like $60 or something. Not terrible, not great either. I was sitting around the $20 mark before we started doing this. You guys cost me 40 bucks. Hurt my heart, hurt my heart. Um, But again, check out CloudFront, seven cents and the simple storage service, one cent. Uh, so far, and I push decent traffic. I don't, I mean, it's not amazing, but I push decent traffic through there. Um, so you know, if you're trying to save yourself a little bit of money, but yeah, DynamoDB is the NoSQL, uh, is their highly scalable, uh, super performant NoSQL database offering. Uh, it's really nice. Um, it is cool. I really do like DynamoDB. Um, it's really fast. Uh, you can do some cool stuff with it. Uh, but the amount that they push this is really annoying super annoying uh actually um like they really love this thing a lot uh the the old developer exam like i'm not joking like 20 percent of the questions were all doing something called uh a calculating read and write capacity for this thing and you can see there's this provisioned read capacity and write capacity these are basically the requests uh the amount of requests that can be made and things to the service that it can support um and so like 20 percent of the questions were just calculating that which was stupid um, I hope it's not still that, but um, yeah, this is their other offering. But tonight we're gonna be talking about RDS. And so maybe at the same time we're spinning up an RDS instance, I can show you how you could do the same thing in EC2 maybe, but database instances now, tonight in particular, if you're gonna follow along and you're gonna spin up an RDS instance, these are the thing that's gonna cost you money. I, I do, I, I, I'm pretty sure they have a free tier of RDS, but RDS is expensive. Uh, it is surprisingly, it was not surprising. It's, it's what costs, uh, it's, it's not cheap. Uh, so if you go over your free tier, um, I don't, I don't know what the free tier for RDS is. Let's see, uh, RDS free tier. Um, we're not really going to do anything with it. So I, you know, maybe run through and set it up and immediately destroy it. We're not really going to do anything with it tonight. I might set up something with it real quick. But uh, so you do get the lowest, uh, you get 750 hours, just like the EC2 instance per month for a year, which is nice. Make sure you keep it there because like I said, this uh, RDS spinning up is pretty expensive. Uh, it, it's, it's, <laughs> I, well, when I spun up, <laughs> so I was trying to be a good cloud practitioner. Uh, and when I was putting my wife's uh, server up, setting up a server for her, I had it as a real, as a WordPress site. I had an EC2 instance and I had RDS as the database because uh, WordPress needs, it uses uh, MySQL, it uses a relational database to manage the data in there. Uh, so I spun up RDS because like that's the service for it. And we ended up, she actually was getting enough traffic to where we could no longer have the free tier one. I actually had to upgrade the database because it was, uh, 
like she would it would basically people would break the site it would get enough traffic to basically break it um and so we upgraded it and i think my bill that next month went from like like twelve dollars for the server um because i ran out of free tier credits on the server i think it went up to like eighty dollars that month because the uh, rds instance was like 60 bucks that month 60 or 70 bucks that month and it hurt my heart it really did hurt my heart but uh rds can be very expensive be careful when you spin up rds while no yeah yes <laughs> end up with 700 dollar bill yeah their support like i said their support is super helpful like i probably need to contact them about that seven well i'm gonna pay that bill uh <laughs> i'm gonna i i have a long story about that that i'll share at the end of this uh about about my personal account uh, it's very frustrating actually um uh but Ar aurora aurora is rds uh it's 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 rds make sure usage always set a budget in the billing plan Ar yeah um get yourself a little uh billing alert can you not enforce budgeting limit on Amazon like you can Azure? So you can, um, yes, you can. The budget $10 per month. Um, yes, you can do that. And you can set up billing alerts as well um, to make it a little bit easier. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do now is simply spin up a database. Uh, and so again, this is also something that I haven't done from the console in a long time, but uh, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, so and they give you a couple of good options. Uh, one big thing. Oh, so RDS, two big things about this. Uh, one is that they provide you, um, really good fault tolerance. Uh, and so this is part of the reason why it's pretty expensive. Uh, so you can set up something called, uh, you can set up multi AZ RDS instances. And so what are AZs go back to what we've learned. Those are availability zones. So those are, you know, the, the data centers within inside a region, uh, that are, you know, they're kind of separate, but they can communicate. Uh, but you can set up this multi AZ thing. So it'll automatically basically set up replication between these things. And so if one database goes down, it can automatically fail over to the other one, which is super duper nice because databases are, are really important. Um, and they also have, uh, these things called read replicas. Um, and so because, uh, you haven't learned, we didn't go over acid yet and we didn't talk about, you know, database transactions and stuff, but databases because of the way that they are, um, you can only uh, you only want to be writing to a single database. Uh, you do not want to be writing data to multiple databases. So people are, you know, uh, creating new content or something and things are being written to a database. You do not. It's, it's really difficult to sync multiple databases together. Um, <clears throat> so what generally happens is you write to a single database, you write to one, you propagate those changes out to other ones and you can read from any of them. You can read from any database. So these are called read replicas. Uh, and so RDS allows you to easily set up something called read replicas. And again, that is when, uh, you know, you write data to one server, one, one RDS instance gets written to, uh, and then it propagates data out to other servers, uh, other RDS instances that act as kind of backups that are replicas of that server. Uh, and then when requests are made, you can use all of those servers to read from. And usually that's where your site, uh, goes down it needs to be able to uh, it needs to be able to respond to reads uh, more so than writes normally for most people um and so those are the two things read replicas and multi az uh setups are kind of the two things they might ask you about i'll send you links to those things as well no need to get dive super deep into them just kind of high level uh understand what those are and like i said i'll send you the exact information about those things but let's go ahead and create a database pretty simple Click that create a database button and it's going to start to walk us through the same way ec2 does what we have and what we can do so i've never used easy create uh, actually it didn't look like this the last time i did it uh by hand i usually do it through either terraform or cloud formation but uh and that's even weird um to be honest but um so let's go through standards so that we can see everything here we're finally running a vnet link databases private network security groups oh man so first off yes yes databases databases are they're interesting they're they're, they're very interesting i have a i have a pretty much hate relationship no, no pretty much have a hate hate relationship with them uh but it's fine so we'll leave it as uh amazon aurora again it's mysql and postgres compatible it's also the cheapest so we'll leave it there to kind of ensure that we, uh, you know, everything's set up properly. Um, and so I want it to have, you have to pick either one. Uh, so I wanted to have MySQL compatibility. Cause like I said, maybe we'll set up a quick uh, WordPress server really quick. 
um and uh the version i'll select the i'll leave it on the default it doesn't really matter to me right now database location so you have a couple options here uh you have regional uh you provision your aurora database in a single aws region and that's all i'm going to do right now i don't need to do global but global you can do it in multiple aws regions uh it writes to the primary aws region so if we set it up in us east one it will that will be the right one that'll be the, the server that everything writes to uh and then it will replicate out to the other servers with a typical latency of less than one second to secondary aws regions uh sure uh great i'm glad they threw that in there but global kind of works the same as that kind of read replica thing where it's going to write to a single server and a single uh, az or a region and propagate changes out to other servers in different regions we're just going to do regional because that's fine now you got a couple of different things here different database features and uh and even when setting this up i don't I like like these are not things you have to specify uh when doing it uh otherwise but i'll leave it here uh one writer and multiple readers this is generally the setup that you're gonna have uh is uh is one write server so write to one server and read from multiple ones so maybe you want to set up you know again for fault tolerance for for scalability as well um write once read write to one read from multiple that's the setup i was just talking about uh multiple writers uh you don't need this um you don't this is this is there's very specific use cases in which you would need this uh serverless um I, we're, not, we're not gonna worry about these just gonna leave it on the first one um that's kind of the main database feature is one writer multiple readers it's got some templates uh, i don't really i actually don't know what either one of these does use defaults for high availability and fast consistent performance this is intended for development outside of a production environment i'll click that because we're messing around don't really know what these templates do to be 100 percent honest then you give it your cluster a name so i'm just gonna call it uh horizons um which is gonna be our cluster name here uh, and then you're gonna need to give it a master username and a master password this is pretty important um i'm gonna do this off well i'm gonna destroy it but uh i'll do it off screen because i don't want y'all trying to log in to, uh, i can i'm not gonna ip restrict it so username is admin um i'll leave it as admin and i'll have it uh auto generate a password i guess it'll let me download it i hope i have no idea um i think it'll let me download it instant size i'll leave it see uh, this is what got me i think this is what got me last time too check this out the <laughs> The one that they have it on by default, this is a this is an expensive server. This is a very expensive server. A DBR5 large. Let's actually look at pricing for this. The RDS pricing. Uh R5. This will cost you a pretty penny. Let's see what we have. On demand for db r5 large 24 cents an hour so you have that running full time uh 24 cents times 24 hours times 30 days is 172 dollars ouch that hurts i don't like it uh, i don't like it at all um but yeah it it, it puts it there by default and I don't I don't know why it does that by default. So we'll go ahead and click this and we'll get down to our uh, what do I need to do? I need to change it to a burstable instead of memory optimized and I'll turn it to dbt2. Where's micro? Can I do micro? Include previous generations. Hmm. I'm confused actually. Does it not let you do how do I see the free tier? This is not how I do the free tier. Well, I'll do small for now, but I don't think small is part of the free tier. It's very interesting. What am I doing wrong here? Uh, why wouldn't it give me a free tier? Oh, well, I'll go small for now. Um, Yeah, I feel you. If it ain't free, it ain't for me. A micro has to be in there as far as free to you. Yeah. Uh, oh, it doesn't exist for oh, for Aurora. Uh, okay. So you're saying that I can do some of these settings choices makes it available. Uh, oh, unavailable. Okay. 
Um, let me see if I can do it with my sequel. Oh, my sequel free tier. Gotcha. Okay. Like I said, I don't usually one. I don't really use the free tier for any of the things that I set up um, for work. Um, and two, I don't do it through the console. So this is a little bit new. Um, database instance identifier. Uh, again, I'm going to call it horizons. I'll call it horizons one. Admin is going to generate a password for me. I hope I can download it. Um, and I did the free tier. So I guess. I'm assuming because I click free tier, this will give me the thing that I can do. Um, is free tier still selected? Yeah, free tier. Okay, cool. Um, so you have your storage type, so you can change the storage type as well, depending on what you need uh, and the space that you have. 20 gigs is more than enough for us right now. Uh, we're not really gonna be doing anything. Enable storage auto scaling, so this allows it to, if you run out of space, if you run out of space on a database server, uh, it will break. <laughs> you run out of space on a server, period, it will break. Uh, but in particular, a database server, it will immediately break uh, once you run out of storage space. Uh, so uh, storage auto scaling is really nice. Um, because it will automatically provision you more uh, storage if you should need it. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, maximum with the storage threshold in case, you know, you want to set a peak amount that you can scale up to. Uh, multi AZ uh, availability and durability. So multi AZ deployment you can get it for free. Uh, but this is what I was talking about with uh, deploying these things in multiple availability zones. <clears throat> so if one in one availability zone should go down, uh, the other one will stay up. Connectivity, I'll leave this through uh, my default VPC. Uh, we didn't talk about VPCs yet, did we? Are we talking about VPCs? I'm pretty sure we are. I'll log in from my other computer. Um, but yeah, just leave that as default and additional connectivity. We can leave everything else. Uh, public accessible, no. Will not assign a public IP address. Oh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this yes for now um, to make it publicly accessible. I don't think we're, I don't, I'm not gonna set up a WordPress uh, right now, uh, but we can log into it and just see some things. Um, VPC security group choose existing. No, I need a new one. That's uh, security group name is uh, uh, Horizon MySQL. So security group, just as they apply to EC2 instances, they also apply here as well. I can check, I can put it in whichever availability zone I want, whatever. Uh, this is the this is the common MySQL port. Every, again, just like uh, Nginx and web servers run over port, um, over port 80 and 443, uh, MySQL runs over port 3306 by default. Um, so I can, you know, pick that port or I'll just leave it there. Um, password authentication um, is, I'll just do that for now so I can actually log in. Um, additional stuff. Initial database name, uh, let's create an initial one again, call it mastermind and we'll create another one by hand when we get in there. You will learn a little bit of SQL commands real quick. Uh, what's also nice about RDS is the way that it backs up in the automatic backups that you have, um, which is really nice. Um, and the snapshotting that you can do with these databases is super nice. So you can set up automated backups like this, so enable automatic backups and keep them around for seven days uh, or however long you want to retain those backups for really nice makes it pretty easy to restore from as well if you have any issues so super nice uh monitoring you can enable some monitoring and things like that so that's great so you can they give you a lot of options to know what's going on with your database uh, and again it's fully managed uh these 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 things are really nice uh because doing these things by hand are really really annoying enable deletion protection that's you know making sure that people can't delete it easily um tell you about the monthly cost it'll estimate it for you down here um and mine, I chose the free tier, so hopefully it'll be free. And I'll click create. And so what this will do is normally a, a database, again, it runs on a server. It runs on the, e like, if you were to run this yourself, uh, you you log into EC2 instance, and you would install MySQL onto there, and you would run it as a service, the same way the Nginx runs, uh, the same way some of the other things that we do run. Uh, but instead, they handle all that for you. It's not an EC2 instance. I mean, it's running on a server, um, but, they set all that stuff up for you. And this instance is spinning up and I'll let it spin up and it should give me an endpoint 
that I can then connect to because I enabled public accessibility. And we'll log in and we'll run a few SQL commands uh, so that we can kind of see how that works as well. What it did not do is it did not give me my password when I said create password. Um, I thought it would give me like a download or something. Uh, so that might be problematic. We may have to redo this because I can't log into it without the password. Let's see if I can find it in here. Um, view credential details. Um, uh, let's, uh, you know, why don't you all look at me? Uh, okay, I got it. I got the password. Uh, I'm gonna put this somewhere real quick. Somewhere safe. Like LastPass, that's where you should go. Hey, LastPass. Uh, we just talked about you. Um, help us be able to get a, a snowmobile. Um, yeah, was, well, we'll clip that. We'll, we'll send that to you as well. Um, cool. So I have the password here and now I'll go back to the screen so you can see what's going on. Um, and is it done yet? Is it done yet? Is it done yet? And did it give me an endpoint yet? I would like my endpoint, please. Um, and so, like I said, is you might say, oh, you have a database. How you connect to the database? How do you use the database? RDS will basically give you an endpoint and it's something that you can connect to over the network. You can connect to it via the endpoint they give you over the port 3306 and you can connect your applications that way. But once it's done provisioning, it should give me one of these uh, endpoints right here because I told it to. Um, I told it to give me a pub uh, to allow for public access. And once it's up, it will give that. Is it still provisioning? Yeah, it's still creating. This might take a little bit of time. Um, does anyone have any questions so far about RDS? Again, you don't need to, for this part of the course, for, for Cloud Practitioner, you do not need to be an RDS pro at all. You don't even need to understand what we just did while setting it up. I just want to kind of get in there and just, uh, I really just want to introduce you to like what a database is and we'll run a couple of SQL commands uh, so that we can get that, so that you can be great. Um, here's what we'll do as well. Uh, ah, great question. It's nice to see how too many cloud providers do give away. Oh yeah. Uh, Bastion jump boxes. Excellent question. So as we dive deeper into our cloud journey and we're going to be learning about security and different uh, practices for uh, accessing things within the cloud. What Simon is talking about, uh, these these Bastion jump boxes are, um, when you set something up in the cloud, um, th we haven't gotten to VPCs and things yet, but um, security is very important. And you may, you can use networking to properly uh, siphon off uh, networking and security groups to be able to uh, to properly secure and siphon off data from uh, uh, traffic from servers um, and things like that. A lot of the times what you'll do is you'll, you won't give, maybe if I have 10 servers inside of my account, I actually won't actually give anyone access to those. They might, they might like, they might actually be able to be accessed from the outside by anybody for safety. Uh, but if you say, Hey, if no one can access it from the outside, how do you manage them? Um, uh, people generally set up a jump box. So this is a intermediate server. So basically what I would do is, uh, I would have a server that I could access from, you know, from any. IP address in my company or anywhere really. Um, and I log into that server and then that jump box, that bastion host is given access to all the other servers. So I have to jump from that box to the other server. So I have to go there first before I can get to the rest. And this adds a layer of security. This adds a layer of, of, of access, or you can kind of control access from one place, which is nice. Um, there are a few tools that make uh, bastion hosts or uh, jump boxes. Uh, I don't necessarily think they're all that uh, necessary anymore. Uh, there are some things in Amazon, uh, like in session manager to allow you to be able to log into things, even if you don't have keys set up for them. Um, databases are a little bit different uh, for databases in particular. You need a jump box. Uh, well, you probably need a jump box. Um, we generally block all outside access to the databases. They're only accessed internally. And so you would need a jump box. What's up, actual Tom? Welcome to the channel. You are the third Raider of the night. Welcome. Thank you everyone from, uh, you know, from actual Tom, come on in. We're just learning a little bit about RDS and databases, relational databases tonight. A little bit of MySQL stuff. We're about to get logged into one of them. Uh, is VPN considered a jump box? Uh, yes, uh, VPN is, uh, it's not considered a jump box, but the same, con yes, the same concept 
of what a gem box is uh, applies for sure. One, 100%, the VPN works very similarly to what, how people use gem boxes. It's you you gain access to one server and you proxy information to, yeah, actually, yeah, it's, uh, uh, that's, that's really good. A VPN is a gem box, uh, basically. Um, it's, 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 it's basically giving, well, it, yeah, it's basically giving, th their intended purposes are different, uh, but it is that same kind of, um, the same kind of access uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, get into one uh, to get into other places. So again, what's up, actual time? Thank you so much for uh, the raid. Get, glad to have you. Good to see you. So, um, learn. Oh, you can learn SQL in Code Academy. Uh, I'll give you the W three schools for SQL. Um, this should be up now, shouldn't it? Please be up. No more creating. Backing up. Does it back up before it gives it to me? Zero connections. Let's see if it gives me the uh, the endpoint already. Yeah, so we have an endpoint right here. So how do we connect to this? Excuse me. I actually don't even know if I have my SQL installed on here or, or my SQL client. So my actually let me go home so that there's space. Uh, my SQL. Whoa, why did it? I hate, I dislike ZSH. Hmm, I don't, I, I don't like that. Okay, so sudo apt install my SQL dash client. So if you want to, if you want to uh, connect to my SQL locally, generally you have to have my SQL installed or the my SQL client. Uh, you have to use that to connect to a my SQL server, uh, which we are about to do right now. Absolutely, thanks, thanks for coming through, uh, for sure. There needs to be an initial backup to restore the initial state. It sounds silly, but to back up zero data, zero schema, zero logs. Yeah, it seems it seems really weird, but uh, hey, I get it. I get it. Um, so now I should be able to type in my SQL. No, I can't. Um, uh, what do I wanna do? I want to... Yeah, there we go. All right, MySQL. All right, so to connect to MySQL, um, I'm gonna do uh, MySQL. Let's see if I remember this. I haven't done this in a long time, so this is fun for me. Uh, yeah, so I do. So I'm gonna connect to a remote MySQL uh, instance. So if I try to, do, if I just typed in MySQL, um, it would try to connect to a local MySQL instance. I'm gonna try to connect uh, this way. So you also there are there are graphical user interface tools. There are GUI tools to connect to MySQL. One of them is MySQL Workbench. Uh, so you can check that out if you want. I'll uh, I'll put that in the classroom as well. Um, if you want to try to mess around with some SQL stuff, um, and you can use that as a way to be able to develop queries and see databases and see information that are in them. If you do not like the command line, uh, but I like the command line. Uh, so dash H for this, uh, dash U admin. Uh, I tried to hide the password from you, um, but I'm not gonna hide it from you. Um, I'm gonna, so dash U, uh, dash use, U is for user, uh, dash P. Actually, no, I don't even need to, I'll do a dash P um, to tell him I wanna put in my password, but I'm not gonna place in the password. Uh, and that's all I need. So tell me to enter the password. Let me, uh, I'll do this so you can't see it. I don't want y'all logging in and uh, doing some weird stuff. You can't really do anything. You can create tables and stuff, which won't really matter, but you can't really do anything to my AWS account. So I might let you see it. I might let you see it. I, this doesn't look like the password that I just copied. Well, let's see. Uh. I didn't like that password, dash u dash p. Um, uh, one second, it did not let me in, that's fine. I'm not hurt yet. Let me see, let me see what happened here. Is the security group open? really quick. Whoa. 
306. It is not. Uh, it is not open. Okay, cool. Edit inbound rules. Um, let me add a rule real quick. Um, custom 3306. Oh, actually, zero. Okay. Save rules. Uh, actually, that's interesting. Because it gave me, oh, it automatically added my IP, I think, because it gave me a response. It gave me a response. And now you can see the password, I don't care. Um, because you can't do anything with it. Um, it gave me a response. If, if if the security wasn't allowing me, I wouldn't be able to do, wouldn't be able to do that. Um, no, oh yes, I, I'm not intentionally hiding the screen. Now, you can see the password, I don't care. Um, Cause like I said, we're gonna destroy this. Uh, one second, really quick. Um, the RDS instance to your IP to be sure. Uh, yeah, I could do that. I don't really care right now. Um, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy this. You can't really do anything to my AWS account from this database anyway. Um, but let me see why it's not letting me in really quick. Admin was the user. I'm pretty sure I'm copying the right password. Uh, that I just put in keep. Pretty sure that's the password I just copied. Um, yeah, that's, uh, or is it this? Edit at 855, I think, th I think this is the password. What time is it? Yeah, this is the password right here. That's the problem. That is the problem. And so we'll take this. All right, so now we are in the database. You can log in if you want. If you feel like typing that in, um, we might, we might break some stuff, but whatever. Um, I'll delete it um in a second but we are now dropped into my sequel uh we are we're we're in our we are in our database server we are logged in basically as an administrator um and then we let's just do uh yeah that's i i figure and like i said we won't be here for long um and it's gonna go away immediately um so i can do something like this uh whoops um there are a number of uh, basically commands similar to that, what you're gonna do in Linux. Um, uh, you're gonna submit commands to kind of this database to, to be able to gather information about things and to perform certain actions. So I can type in, um, uh, show databases like I, like I clicked here and it shows me the databases that are in here. Um, we created by default, this, uh, mastermind table, the rest of these tables are tables that are automatically created when you spin this up that MySQL uses to actually run. Uh, and so to use a database, uh, to, to like actually like go into a database, you gotta use it first. So I have to tell it, say, hey, go ahead and use Mastermind. And you gotta put these uh, these semicolons at the end of SQL to kind of let it know that you're at the end of your command. And it says database changed. And I can click show tables. And it'll show me what tables exist inside of this database. This is a fresh database, so no tables are there. Um, and maybe let's take a look real quick at the W3 schools thing real quick and just, I don't know, maybe it'll tell us to do some cool stuff. So um, a query statement that you can do is like, uh, when you wanna find out some information, uh, maybe if I had, maybe I had a database, uh, again, called Twitch users or something, and, um, and I wanted to find out information about you all, um, I could do something like this. And the select keyword right here is the keyword that, uh, that, tells it to kind of start looking for data and to, and to get, get information for you. And you can use things like this, like a wild card. So this says select star from customers. So basically it's saying, hey, give me everything from this place. So it actually becomes, uh, when you start diving into it, it comes pretty easy actually to understand what's happening because it says, hey, select, give me everything from this thing, from, from this collection. So customers is probably a table or database or whatever. Um, and it'll give you back, that will give you all the things from that table, the database, whatever, uh, from the customer's table here. Um, interesting. Um, why do they go straight from giving me just a select into other stuff? So, um, I encourage, I'll put this in there. I encourage to, I encourage you to, to check this out and to learn a little bit about SQL. Um, the commands are, are pretty simple. Uh, I forgot that we wouldn't have, uh, maybe I could have imported a database to kind of show you around. Let's look at, let's actually look at, uh, let's actually uh, select, uh, let's look at the MySQL table. Oops. Um, no, not select my table, use MySQL. So I want to use the MySQL database. 
So now I'm using a different database and I'm gonna type in show tables so I can see the different data structures that are in here. So these are all the tables that are in here. So again, think about an Excel sheet. Uh, think about those, uh, think about each of the pages. Think about the columns in there. Think about the fields that are in there. Uh, this is very similar. So we have some tables in here uh, and these different tables have different things in them. So if I want to um, show like time zone, I can, um, I can maybe say select, um, select star from time zone or yeah from time underscore zone and see if we get anything and now we get all these entries we get all these fields that have data in them so uh, these are all different pieces of data and again it's it's it doesn't mean anything to us because we haven't done with like yeah it, it this is something for i don't know why i did that um this is something for my sql to use uh and not us but again you can just do that it's, it's just a way to again structure your data and to be able to interact and manage your data uh sql is really nice it's a great tool to pick up it's something to know um actually there's a user's table so i can um let's show let's let's do the same select statement that we did let's do it from users and see now if we can see uh some different users from user and look at that now we get a different uh set of data um, and we selected everything and we could also do some stuff where it's like uh, where we could select information. So maybe we wanted a specific username, but we wanted all the information about that user. We could do something like select star from user where like name where like name equals uh, whatever the, the username is. And so it becomes again, very uh, it's almost like uh, it becomes like plain English. Now it does get super complicated when you get into joins and things like that. And you're, you're combining data and you're doing more complex queries. Uh, but the basics of SQL are actually pretty simple and I highly encourage you to dive into it. But uh, that that's it. That like, that's really all it is tonight. Um, not a ton. Like I said, tonight will be not quite as fun as the rest of the stuff uh, because there's nothing super exciting uh, in the earlier stages of uh, kind of the Amazon things about uh, what to do manually with RDS unless you're doing stuff with sysops uh, kind of, and that's more about that's more so about asking how to set things up for fault tolerance and uh, and availability rather than kind of learning about uh, databases uh, the database stuff might be um, might be more equipped for like actually getting in there and doing a bunch of stuff maybe we'll do some of that in pipelines uh, and maybe honestly not even pipeline maybe we'll also do that in decoded to be honest uh, where we're actually getting in and learning some of that SQL and putting some data and stuff in but that's uh yeah that's that like i said i'll give you some time back tonight what again what are the tangible takeaways for tonight one is that uh amazon has uh one understanding that uh there's other things besides the cloud uh or before the cloud that was on-prem people had you know their own places where they hosted their services and their hardware from uh and people still have those things as well uh so that's any place that that a, a, a user is uh is hosting their services and data and hardware um and then we learned about hybrid clouds uh so that is the combination of you know either a virtual pr uh, private cloud or a uh, public cloud and on-prem any combination of those to create a kind of singular computing environment um it's pretty common we learned about some tools that enable the hybrid cloud that enable some on-prem uh deployments on-prem uh to be able to for ways to for you to be able to use AWS services and uh, some of the great things that they have uh, on prem. Some of those things are AWS Snowball, which allows you to move data, Snowball at Edge, which allows you to kind of perform some of those workloads at the edge as well. Um, uh, and Amazon Snowmobile, which allows you to move exabytes of data, you know, out of your own uh, on prem places into the cloud, into AWS. We learned about Storage Gateway, which is uh, either a physical or a virtual device which allows you to uh, be able to easily move uh, data uh, to be able to transfer data in and out as well caches data locally so it's a little more real time um, caches data locally for your local storage and local devices to be able to pick up on uh, but it also sends that stuff to amazon in the background and manages that data transfer uh, we learned about code deploy which just helps you automate code deployments we learned about ops works a little bit which uses chef and puppet to help you be able to define configurations for servers and services uh servers and systems uh to, for automatic uh setup of them um uh, which is nice we'll be doing a whole lab with that um so that'll be fun 
uh and then we learned about rds we learned about uh databases a little bit we learned a little bit about relational databases versus uh no sql databases uh which is not only sql i uh, learned a little bit about what sql is uh even though we didn't dive deep into it at all but again as you start to it, it, these are things that you should start to write down and say hey all right you know now i know about it i i know what a database i know a database stores data in a structured way that's what i learned today and now i need to dive into how you know if we're saving data like how do i get the data that i need and that's sql and maybe i need to go uh start to look into sql and just you know get high level hands on with that thing we learned that the service that serves uh, relational database purposes is Amazon's RDS, Relational Database Service. It's one of their only really good names for services. Very descriptive. I like it a lot. Um, and we learned that you can spin up an RDS instance uh, pretty quickly uh, by clicking through a few buttons. It's a fully managed service. We also learned that it might be a little bit of a, it might be a little bit expensive. So make sure you're on the free tier. Um, but it does. It is a bit costly. Fully managed service, uh, which is nice. We learned that it supported a couple of different types of uh of of database options relational database options including uh mysql postgres uh sql server oracle um i think there were two or three others but the list is there um maybe we should look at it um but the list is there um so that's super nice um and yeah Oracle server MariaDB, which is mysql basically uh and that they have their own version called aurora which uh which is compatible with MySQL or Postgres, which is cheaper, uh, which they will you know, allow you to pay a little bit less money to run. Um, we also talked a bit about Dynamo. Um, just wanted to introduce you to, I gave you, I gave you one of Amazon's, uh, I, gave it, I gave you Amazon's relational database offering, uh, and then I gave you Amazon's, I just wanted you to know about Amazon's NoSQL uh, option as well, which is DynamoDB. Not super important to know about that right now or to go in depth with that, but just wanted to just bring it up as something to know. So we're learning about the cloud. Um, and then we just kind of learned how to, after we spun it up, we learned how to log in a little bit, uh, just to hopefully pique your interest a little bit with, uh, with uh with learning sql a little bit um and again you don't need to do these things from the command line there are things like mysql workbench uh but i highly recommend you do uh try it from the command line uh it's uh, a really great skill to have uh it's also not nearly i think it's one of the hot like it's one of the bigger like instant gratification things that you do like because you're basically submitting commands and getting immediate feedback or relatively immediate feedback um and there's a lot of things you can do you can uh, make these requests uh you can write queries to make requests and write those things to a file and you can do all kinds of cool stuff in there so it's pretty dope uh but yes uh remind me what you recommend for using python to create a dialogue decision tree now great question um so uh dialogue decision tree i've seen some interesting things done recently with dynamo db and dialogue decision trees uh, for kind of real-time decision-making and processing of certain information. Uh, whether or not that's the best thing, I don't know. Um, so are you asking particularly about infrastructure underneath that, or are you asking about frameworks uh, for doing that? Because uh, I think there are, I think there's actually some frameworks out there specifically for that. Uh, like, a, like a, it sounds to me like you're talking about like a Python recommendation engine. Um, and I want to say, I want to say they have like a pretty popular, uh, mostly how to write it out. Um, yeah. So recommendation engines are interesting, um, because, uh, they generally are going to have to, uh, be updated relatively constantly, um, depending on the data gathered, um, uh, to be able to give proper recommendations back, um, the way to, uh, how to, how to write it out. Um, that's, that's interesting. I don't know if there's an easy way for me to, to say how to write it out here. Um, because you're going to be, I mean, so it looks like they're going to be using pandas and numpy here to do that. So it actually looks like they're going to be making some, uh, some interesting decisions using a little bit of machine learning. Um, let me see. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to lead you astray because that's not something I've never done a lot of that. Um, I would probably use I, like 
as a first thought i probably end up using the packages that they have here because these are these are pretty popular packages that allows you to do um some interesting co uh computational things uh if you're not familiar with numpy i would check out numpy um and pandas um and they're in here um, i'm not sure what they're doing here um but i just off a first glance i would probably do some um actually i don't want to like now that i'm thinking through it uh this might be bigger than i thought it was um i don't know maybe that's something we could sit down and uh maybe some maybe that's something we'll try to to think about um are you building are you building one right now or are you planning on building one and um are you how many approximately how many like uh data points are you going to be using to make this decision or are you gonna have people kind of uh, uh like are people gonna kind of answer like a couple like yes or no questions to be able to uh to figure this out or um or is it gonna be more like a netflix style you you've watched these things here is this thing because uh, i think those are two complete i think the, the implementation of that might be two different uh two different uh paths Yes, no questions about five questions. Um, yeah, I'll actually send you a open source repo for something someone built as an built as an Alexa skill um, for exactly that for a pretty popular um, website um, that never got off the ground. Um, I'll see if I can find it real quick. I, I don't know exactly where it is, um, but it was it was interesting. And I don't think the Alexa skill is going to show you uh exactly how to do it in python but it might help you figure out how to like think about structuring it because i thought it was pretty interesting uh, it seemed pretty simple and it was just alexa would basically ask them a few questions uh to try to give them a a a recommendation uh and i thought it was pretty interesting but yeah it's pretty interesting um as you're kind of researching that i'd like to know a little bit more about that too so uh, one of the things that i'm going to be doing during the 100 days of code and some of the, like one of the things that i'm super interested in i've talked about it before is um I've really been diving into software uh, as opposed to infrastructure. I know infrastructure pretty well. I know infrastructure automation and like, I know I know pretty well. Um, and software has really piqued my interest. So building out things like that uh, sound really cool to me, uh, actually. Um, and so like, I'm, I'm going to be starting to build out some cooler things. Um, and yeah, I, I hope to know more about things like that in the next year, to be honest. In that case, a, a state machine might be a simple solution. Uh, yeah, um, yes, could be, could be a simple solution. I think it depends on yeah, how, like how much decision making you're trying to do, um, and and how many possible solutions you may have. But yeah, I, I think that could work. I definitely think that could work. But that's it for tonight. Um, I I took up a lot of your time uh, that I was going to give back to you. But uh, who we're we gonna raid tonight? Who are we going to head over to see? Um, we are back next week with again. Oh, Monday. So Monday is going to be that uh, Elastic Beanstalk Ops Works Lab. Uh, that will be hands on. We're going to be starting. That one will go long. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's going to go long. It's going to go plan three hours, uh, plan three hours, plan till 10 um again if you don't finish i will do it in a way um that you can catch up afterwards if you can't say the whole time no big deal uh but uh i think we'll need to go until 10. make sure you have um a, uh, i guess you can do everything inside of amazon but make sure you have a text editor um and make sure you have your computer set up uh with your uh with aws cli um just because we're gonna be doing a little uh, some things but you can i think you can actually do everything through amazon but we are gonna do i'm probably not gonna start there um so make sure you're ready for that and mentally come ready because again we're gonna be writing some code and i'm gonna try to give you some code because it's not important that you learn how to code uh what, I, what the goal of coming out of that is going to be uh understanding like what you can do and what it does uh what, what is this oh that's that's really annoying um and yeah what it does and like and like seeing it in action i think it's really important to see these things in action um but i'm not you're not gonna be a pro at elastic wean soccer chef in one day but i do want to be able to give you some stuff to copy and paste and to run through and do that uh and actually provision infrastructure and see how easy it is uh kind of i kind of want to get you hooked on automation uh really early uh can i update my github with those yes i can so 
uh real quick actually yes i can do that real quick um and on next monday yes monday coming up uh as that's when it'll be absolutely simon thank you for coming by thanks for you know having some great dialogue uh i loved your input um yeah have a good night have a good night uh, we're gonna get some of these files updated so i guess my other question to you uh doctor i oh, no, not dr Buckwell, wow, who asked that uh sully is although this is what you're seeing as my current uh setup my the one i i don't this is not my setup anymore um but i can provide this to you um and i'll provide it in there as like a backup uh but if i click in here let me show you this uh, i've simplified my setup and now my setup looks like what i want display capture uh display and stop showing the cap card uh it looks more like this with this i have a i have a simple prompt uh what's it called so yeah it's like real nice it's like real clean uh my vim my vimrc is the same i think like if i go to documents uh my vimrc uh pretty much looks the same um but i'll show you both of these. i mean i can send i can send them both Starting that py i don't know i know you're uh manning both pop os and ubuntu 24 uh so yes yeah, so great question um this is what you're looking at right now is windows um my pop os is right here actually so i'm actually away from ubuntu uh this is my actually my system 76 laptop it's actually this is actually an actual laptop with you know all my stickers but this is my system 76 galago um and it's just i haven't used it in a while so i need to actually get it all updated um this is the one i'm ending but i'm gonna push my newest stuff up because you can actually go back in the history of github to get to my older stuff so let me push my newest stuff up right now because i think that's the most pertinent uh so maybe it'll help for me to just when you can watch me do this uh because that's kind of my newest setup so all right i should close my laptop and um, I'm not managing my uh, my dot files here properly on this computer. Um, so I'll just have to move them into that repo. Uh, so I'll go into config files. I'm going to copy um, slash dot my vim rc. I'm gonna copy it right here to init.vim for anyone using, uh, for anyone who's using NeoVim. And I'm going to also copy it just right here um and then i'm going to so update june 3rd i'm also going to copy my hyper oh no so my hyper i, I stopped using hyper here this settings.json is for windows terminal so if you want your windows terminal to look like this uh you can grab that but my hyper terminal my hyper one is in here um already that's up to date and what else do i need i think i just need my vimrc and my zshrc so uh copy slash dot zsh rc copy this here and let's see what's been updated and in it now vim get uh commit um updated um zsh rc or simple prompt and uh i think i also in there and vim color scheme i'm pretty sure i changed my vim's color scheme there and mastermind okay now we have them updated i switch up stuff a lot so um i try to remember i need to really start managing my dot files on all my computers properly uh but i don't uh, but one day i will but now you should be able to grab it if you want it i have the galago pro alongside seven think pads yeah i do so i have an x1 carbon as well um which is really nice yeah um I, i've heard good things about the new macbook air too i really like my x1 carbon um also i don't know if anyone's heard but lenovo is actually going to be supporting linux on all their workstation grade computers so the p series and all the think stations uh they're certifying it uh starting next month actually uh so it's gonna be pretty dope uh, definitely pretty dope 
yeah 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 100 percent. okay so um i owe you guys a bunch of stuff i'm gonna get it anyone who's been trying to follow on youtube uh, i still did not render out last week's videos i'm very sorry uh they're queued up they're they're edited the the, the beginning is cut off i just haven't pressed the render button because i haven't had a good stopping point to where my computer could be pretty much useless for me to render out things i have a powerful computer but uh the, my render settings have it uh it pretty much makes my computer almost unusable um so that can render pretty quickly and it's also going to be like 15 to 20 hours of video that i'm rendering out so it's going to take a bit of time uh so i'm going to try to get that done tonight and try to upload it in the morning my upload speeds aren't amazing because comcast is the only thing that's available in baltimore city and again i have gigabit internet uh, so i have gigabit download speeds but i have uh 30 30 megs max or 30 gigs max up or yeah 30 gigs max up uh which really kind of sucks um for uploading large files they're all about like they all end up being like 10 gigs because again they're like three hours so cool have four through the newest eighth gen x1 carvers oh so the eighth gen i wanted the eighth gen but it was really like they're always super expensive when they when they come out so i actually have a seventh gen i have a seventh gen x1 carbon um and i like it i like it a lot the only thing i don't like is i got it with a 4k screen and the 4k screen uh the battery life is not great uh for for ultrabook like that but i'm starting to ride my bike into the office now and i've, I've practiced it a couple times the x1 carbon it makes it so like it makes it makes it so much easier to ride it uh ride the bike in but when i'm at the office like i'm gonna be plugged in anyway uh i also have a i'm getting an, an egpu for it though so i can do some you know content stuff uh from the office uh because i have a i have a spare 1070 ti sitting around uh so i'm just gonna get a little external uh, EG, uh enclosure so i can do some cool stuff with it but that's it for tonight who are we raiding uh let me open this up who are we heading over to see who is streaming i need to fin i need to finish so much stuff tonight's the night i've been i got i'm not gonna lie i've been because of everything that's going on just to kind of blow off some steam i um, mean like i said me and my friends been playing some games i've been playing way more games this week than normal uh so my, my excuse this week for not getting you the things that i'm supposed to get you is simply because i've been gaming uh, again i'll keep it real with y'all i'm not gonna lie and say i'm crazy busy i am busy uh but when i've been getting off the streams i've been playing with my friends and playing games with my friends and it's been it's been really nice to kind of blow off steam in, in that way um but i'm gonna get you guys everything that i promised you uh i'm gonna get it to you i really am gonna get it to you but like i said this week is was it was just a lot but let's head over to see someone anyone does anyone that we know on right now uh doesn't look like it but let's let's check out let's scroll a little bit lower into into the ranks let's see if we can make someone's day uh this person's giving away a hundred dollars a hundred dollar contest i don't know maybe we have to go over there see if we can win some money uh let's see chill programming what's the number whoa this so professor pete it's educational let's head over to the professor say hello i think it'll be pretty fun and rig oh you got a thread ripper i wanted a thread ripper so bad i wanted the thread ripper so bad by the time they were released um i was waiting for the 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 big boy which i think was a 3970 uh is that the one that's or no 3990 because it was like it was like three thousand nine hundred ninety dollars and then i was like yeah like i don't need that uh so i ended up getting the the uh the ryzen 9 uh instead the high the 30 was 3950 or whatever Woo. Uh, I don't know what you, I, I don't know what you do with that computer, but that is uh, pretty intense. Uh, that's pretty intense, <laughs> really, really intense. I thought my rig was 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 powerful, but uh, that's pretty crazy. MG, thank you so much for the bits. One hundred percent. You uh, just just are, are you not, you know what MG? You got to be VIP. You want you want stuff, I, which I have not sent off yet. It's coming. It's they're still sitting here. It's coming. I promise you. Um, oh, tons of virtual. Oh, and hash cracking. That's pretty dope, actually. I may need to talk to you a little bit about some of that stuff. Uh, I don't. I've. I've. My days of crazy virtualization are kind of over. Uh, but hash cracking. Uh, it sounds very interesting to me. Um, and I've. I've always been interested in that world a little bit. Uh, but MJ, you gotta give me IP. You have to. You. 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 No. No one. No one is. Uh. Is. Is more of a VIP. Um. Okay. Let's head over to that rig. Sounds great, actually. I'm gonna sell you. We're gonna we're gonna talk Sully. We're gonna we're gonna have some combos. Uh, but yeah, let's head over to Professor Peter. Let's uh, say hello. Raid. Let's see if we can type it right. Professor, profess, 
Where is it? I lost it already. Is it just Professor Peter? Yeah, Professor Peter. Let's head over. We'll pay for an HP. Ooh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, let's say hi. Let's uh let's listen to show them how great we are. But thanks for another great stream. Um, I hope to see you all next week. Tomorrow on um tomorrow on decoded. If anyone's interested in decoded, we are learning algorithms tomorrow in preparation for a hundred days of code starting next week. Uh, again, I'm down for anyone here to do 100 days of cloud. If you are, uh, if you don't care about any of the coding stuff, information will be coming out starting tomorrow about all of that uh, into next week. And we'll be starting on Monday, on Tuesday. We're going to start the 100 days of code on Decoded, which is on Tuesday. Uh, but we'll start the 100, we can start the 100 days of cloud on Monday. Let's check it out. But cool. Peace out. Let's go say hello.